Good evening. I hereby call the Palm Springs regular city council meeting of February 24th, 2022 to order. Uh, I would like to invite uh, you to stand with me uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. City Clerk, could you conduct the roll call, please? Councilmember Holstedge. Here. Councilmember Kors. Here. Councilmember Woods. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Here. Mayor Middleton. Present. All councils present. Thank you. All right. We are going to get started with a few presentations. And first, I would like to uh, begin with uh, the uh, representative from Akashur, uh, the new arena in the Coachella Valley, and uh, invite him to talk about all things ice hockey. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, can you guys see that? All right, I will go ahead and begin. So Akershur Arena is coming to town. We are building a state-of-the-art facility. Uh, we are on schedule to open late 2022. Arturo, you're, you're not, yes? we cannot see the presentation. There we go. Now, we, see now we're getting it. Okay, can you guys hear me? Madam Mayor, I, I'm sorry. I think um, Arturo's connection's pretty bad. Yeah, I think it is. I am actually on the road because I am headed to Village Fest. Yeah, Arturo, I think we may need to reschedule this for another day. Okay, I will go ahead and do that then. All right. Sorry Eric. about that. Thank you. And we look forward to hearing about it. Okay, thank you so much. I'll be on the next one for sure. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. So we will move forward and the next uh, presentation will be our regular COVID presentation. And for that, I'd like to invite Daniel DeSelms to step forward. Hi, right, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hopefully it actually works this time. Uh, it looks like it's working this time. Great. So tonight, I just want to share a quick update on our COVID data, uh, which has seen a uh, good improvement over the past two weeks since we talked on the 10th. Uh, here's the six metrics that the state and county are tracking. A as you can see, all of them continue to show improvement. Uh, when you look at the case rates for both the state and the county per 100,000, the state and county are both averaging uh, 30 and 29, respectively. Uh, so that, that daily case rate has continued to go down, as well as hospitalization rates and ICU rates have seen significant improvement, 30% uh, reduction in hospitalizations, and 25%, over 25% uh, increase in ICU bed space. Uh, so things are continuing to improve. I just want to remind council that as we start to see this progress, the, the improvements are going to be less dramatic as we find finally settle into that new normal uh, as we did last spring. So Riverside County saw uh, cases nearly half uh, week over week. So last week's reporting was actually eight days because of Monday's holiday. So that having is actually probably better than half. Uh, and then next week we'll have six days of reporting. So the, the numbers for this week and next week will look a little bit off, but uh, significant improvement overall. Uh, on average, the county is seeing about 600 cases per day. Uh, just for reference, a couple of weeks ago, we were still seeing 2,000 cases per day. So significant improvement. Uh, 
Uh, here in the city, we saw a 12% reduction in new cases week over week. Uh, all of the city data uh, appears to be in a similar place to where we were back in uh, early October. Uh, so we're, we're doing really well. And if we compare what we're at right now to the state and county per 100,000 residents, uh, like I said, they're both somewhere right around 30 cases per 100,000 per day. Uh, the city is at 19. So we're actually seeing about nine cases per day. So when you do the math uh, to 100,000 uh, population ratio, uh, we're still far better than the state and the county. Uh, the Coachella Valley, again, seeing significant improvements. There were a couple of cities that did see a little bit of a blip. Uh, I call it that because uh, the numbers that increased, uh, one of the cities saw uh, an increase of eight cases uh, as a change. So that's, that's not uh, a significant enough number. Uh, to be concerning, especially since we're seeing such drastic improvements. Uh, our wastewater treatment plant data also continues to see improvement. Uh, well, so the trend line kind of obscures where the data points actually sit. If you look at the bottom right screen where the blue dots actually are, it it's actually sits below the trend line and we'll look closer at that on the next slide. Uh, our viral load continues to, to, to plummet re really rapidly. If you look on the bottom right, you can see, uh, you know, last Tuesday, we only had 95,000 uh, count for our viral load compared to, you know, almost 7 million uh, middle of last month. So we're seeing very dramatic improvement. Uh, so all of our metrics are looking promising. Uh, and in a comparison from this year to last year, you know, I said our numbers are starting to look the same as they were back in October. Uh, our viral load in the wastewater treatment data is sitting about where we were uh, last spring as we started to, to fall to our, our, some of our lowest numbers. Uh, and here's what GT Molecular is estimating our case count to be. Again, this is last week. Uh, we saw more improvement this week. So last Tuesday, they estimated we had 550 cases of COVID in Palm Springs. So that's residents and anybody else that uh, is using our wastewater. Uh, and if you look back in the middle of January, that was up around 40,000. So uh, very significant improvements over all of the metrics. We finally uh, sorted out that, that backlog of data and uh, things are looking really the same as they were as we entered into last spring. Uh, and that's all I have, Madam Mayor. And, and Mayor, if, if, if I could quickly, uh, as you know, council gave direction um, last meeting and delegated authority to the city manager, um, that's me, to lift restrictions when the data suggested it was appropriate to do so and outlined a handful of those indicators. So we've seen those indicators met at this point. We've had consecutive week over week decline of transmission. We've had also um, significant relative drop when you look at the previous high. We've also seen significant improvement in hospitalization. So we are prepared at this point to declare that as of next Monday, we will lift our local restrictions and uh, realign with the state moving forward. Uh, Mr. Clifton, I think that's very encouraging news to an awful lot of uh, people. Uh, council, are there questions, comments? Uh, for either Danny or for Mr. Clifton. All right. Well, Danny, thank you. And uh, what we know is uh, this virus continues to mutate. So let's hope it, it stays in this direction. So. Our next presentation is also a COVID uh, presentation. And uh, uh, this uh, virus has killed many people. Uh, including numerous friends and neighbors. Uh, last count, 150 people in California or in Palm Springs. And I'd like to turn it over to Mayor Pro Tem Garner for a reading of the COVID-19 Memorial Day Proclamation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Whereas the first Monday in March has been designated as COVID-19 Victims and Survivors Memorial Day, and whereas COVID-19, an illness caused by a virus that can transmit from person to person, has spread across the world, creating a global pandemic that is having catastrophic effects on human life, our community, and our economy, 
And whereas local and state governments, health departments, and public servants have taken bold actions to protect residents, supporting strug support struggling local economies, and find innovative ways to provide services. And whereas in response to rapid spread of COVID-19 and past stay-at-home orders, essential workers stepped up to provide critical services to help protect our communities and save lives, sacrificing their own health and safety. And whereas COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on low-income communities and communities of color, exacerbating inequities already prevalent in our systems that we must address as a nation. And whereas public health guidance and policies targeted at prevention, such as social distancing, wearing masks in public, and staying home, help mitigate the spread of COVID-19, prevent illness, and lessen the burden on individuals and societies. And whereas the symptoms and severity of COVID-19 can vary dramatically by individual and the long-term health implications for survivors is largely unknown, as many survivors suffer with lingering side effects of the disease long after they no longer test positive. And whereas more than 5.9 million people worldwide and 941,000 in the United States have lost their lives due to COVID-19, and in Palm Springs alone, 150 lives have been lost to this deadly virus. And whereas each life lost to COVID-19 mattered and leaves a hole in the hearts of loved ones, family members, and the surrounding community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Palm Springs, California, hereby proclaims the first Monday in March as COVID-19 Memorial Day in remembrance of those who have lost their lives and in honor of those who are forever marked by COVID and continue to suffer from the impact of this virus. Thank you. <clears throat> our next presentation is a proclamation uh, for our esteemed city clerk, uh, Anthony Mejia, who's moving on to an, a new assignment. Uh, whereas Anthony Mejia has dutifully served as city clerk since December 4, 2017, whereas in 2018, Anthony was instrumental in the creation of a city council district-based electoral system, which involved the strategic coordination of over 35 public engagement workshops, hearings, and California Voting Rights Act working group meetings. And whereas in 2020, in the midst of the novel coronavirus pandemic, Anthony enthusiastically embraced the challenges to ensure residents were afforded the opportunity to be heard by their elected officials in a new virtual setting, working tirelessly to maintain a constant flow of communication and uninterrupted services. And whereas Anthony has utilized over 18 years of municipal clerk experience to serve the residents of Palm Springs and support city council efforts towards greater transparency, diversity, and inclusion through the implementation of translation and interpretation services. Whereas Anthony is greatly appreciated at City Hall for his helpful nature and attention to detail, his dedication to the professional development of his staff and clerks across the state is a reflection of the selfless attitude and passion he holds toward democracy and good governance. Whereas Anthony is respected by so many for his incredible dedication to the Palm Springs community. Thank you, Anthony, for being a proud representative of the city and the embodiment of its commitment to excellent and responsive public service. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, by the power vested in us with deep appreciation of his service, do hereby proclaim February 24, 2022, Anthony Mejia Day. Anthony, would you like to say? Uh, I'll be really brief. Um, I didn't want to be on camera the whole time because I'd be doing nothing but crying. Um, it's been a real honor to be serving this council for the last four years. Um, you know, my first week was such an honor. It was to swear in three new council members and to create the first California all LGBT city council. Um, 
and then to meet Grace Gardner through the CVR working group. This has been an incredible honor. Um, the past four years have been nothing but exciting <laughs> um, and, and full of new opportunities. Um, and I've had the amazing opportunity to work with great professionals, department heads, uh, up and down the organization, but most importantly, it's my, my team. Uh, whether it was Terry Milton and Cindy Berardi, or my new team of Tiffany, Brent, Sabrina, and Monique. Uh, everybody is amazing in this city, and it's just been an honor to uh, work with you. Thank you. Anthony, thank you. Uh, our next uh, presentation uh, is going to be a remembrance for uh, someone we recently lost who uh, was such a treasure to our community. And for that, I call on Council Member Jeff Kors. Great. Um, thank you, Mayor Middleton. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll ask that we, um, when we adjourn tonight, we do it in memory of uh, Charles Dunn. And I want to share a little bit about Charles, who um, Many of us knew and were friends with, given his work in City Hall, as well as uh, throughout so many uh, parts of our community. So Charles moved to Palm Springs in 1992 and opened the Desert Institute of Travel. 2003, he started an ancestry business called Your Family Name, a popular store in downtown Palm Springs. He later became involved with the Walk of Stars program through his friendship with celebrities, including his dear friend, Carol Channing. Charles is a warm and loving man who enjoyed meeting new people in retirement he also drove for Uber and occasionally filled in at the front desk at Palm Springs City Hall. And Charles was much loved here in City Hall and a smile and ever present good cheer was an inspiration to all. In 2017, City Manager David Reddy nominated Charles to receive the prestigious County of Riverside Senior Inspiration Award representing the city of Palm Springs. And Charles was proud to accept that honor. He was born on July 23rd, 1944 in Winfield, Louisiana. After winning a statewide typing contest, Charles moved to Washington, D.C. as a teenager. Through a friend whose uncle was a U.S. Senator, Charles Dunn worked in the Speaker's office in the U.S. House of Representatives before being assigned to the Kennedy White House at the outset of the Cuban Missile Crisis. At his desk located outside the Oval Office, Dunn helped with many of JFK's speeches, including President's address that he was to deliver in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. During his days in the White House, he befriended Jacqueline Kennedy's social secretary, Tish Baldridge, who introduced him to the first lady. As Jackie was emptying her office after Dallas, she gave him a painting that Charles proudly displayed on his wall in Palm Springs for many years. After, after President Kennedy's assassination, Charles worked for President Lyndon Johnson before being transferred to the Pentagon. Drafted into the military in 1965, he served in Texas until 1967. Afterwards, he used a GI Bill to enroll at Oregon State University, graduated in 1972. He campaigned unsuccessfully for a seat in the Oregon State House in 1972 and taught high school from 1972 to 1983. Charles Dunn was truly a remarkable man who had a special role in presidential history of the uh, Kennedy administration. And we as of Palm Springs are proud to have known him and uh, miss him. Uh, and just thank him for all he did for so many in our community. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, the last presentation is going to be a statement that uh, I am going to read. I'm very proud to be the mayor of the city of Palm Springs. We are an imperfect but unique city. And for generations, we have been a place of refuge and renewal. It is in that spirit of our city and our history that I must say something this evening. On Tuesday, Texas Governor Greg Abbott issued a directive to state agencies to investigate and prosecute the parents of transgender children and their health care givers. He has labeled the parents of transgender children who support their children on their journey to be the best and whole person that they can be to be child abusers. Texas district attorneys are uncertain or of mixed opinion of what the new directives mean, but there are reports of parents already who are supportive of their transgender children who are fearful that they could have their children removed from their homes and placed in foster care. 
The University Transgender Health Center in Metropolitan Dallas has closed. Please try to understand what it means to be the parent of a transgender child. Please imagine the tears throughout the family as your child told you their truth, their most difficult, essential, and personal truth, a truth like anything you had ever known. You had a choice. Can I and do I stand with my child? You made the choice to stand up for your child, to give your child the best opportunity to be the best person they could be. And the governor of the state of Texas wants to prosecute you for standing up for your child. The governor of the state of Texas wants to turn your neighbors into his enforcement arm. Please try to imagine what it is like for the mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and grandparents of a transgender child tonight in the state of Texas. Can you imagine the heartache, the questions of what we do, can we do, what should we do, what will the state of Texas do, and where will we go? Now, try to imagine the transgender child in that family and what their heart is telling them as they watch every person they love in agony and anger. Family comes first. It is not an idle statement. It is what we all know. But no matter what else is before us, if we have to choose, we choose family. Well, if not in Texas, in Palm Springs, we stand with transgender children and their families. I know all of the stories. I know all of the explanations. I have lived this life. We are who we are. You cannot change a child into someone they are not. But what you can do and what this will do is break their spirit. I know I am today a transgender woman. But while I have always been and will always be transgender, I have never had the opportunity to be a transgender child because I wasn't brave enough to come out. I wasn't brave like the transgender children in Texas or Florida or South Dakota or Missouri or like those here in California. They and their parents have shown bravery and courage that is unimaginable to me when I was their age. And they've done so in the face of dangerous and discriminatory attacks. I am in awe of the transgender children and their parents that I meet. Spend 10 minutes with them, any one of them, and you will be as well. I have, from the city of Palm Springs, a message to transgender children and their families everywhere. You are loved, you are supported, you are respected, and you will always have a home in the city of Palm Springs. You will always have a home in California. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. Our next item is acceptance of the agenda. The city council will discuss the order of the agenda and may amend the order at urgency items. No abstentions or no votes. Our consider calendar items or request consent calendar items be removed for separate discussion. I would like to make a motion for the acceptance of the agenda. Are there any items that staff or a council member would like removed from the consent calendar for separate discussion or vote. Seeing none. Uh, Uh, I, I would like to uh, make a motion that we uh, uh, 
continue item 5C, the appeal of the Historic Site Preservation Board uh, decision regarding the removal of uh, the statue in front of City Hall. Is there a second for that motion? Seeing no second, the motion fails. Report of closed session. I would like to request the city attorney Ballinger provide a report of closed session. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes, Madam uh, Mayor, members of the uh, city council, members of the public. The city council met earlier to discuss the items that are listed on the agenda. Uh, the city council did not discuss the labor negotiations, uh, and there was no local action. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is public testimony. This is public testimony on non-public hearing agenda items only. The next, this time has been set aside for members of the public to address the city council on non-public hearing agenda items only. Two minutes will be assigned to each speaker. You will be asked to begin your time by telling us what agenda item or items you are speaking about. Please note that testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the public hearing and general public comment for subjects not on the agenda will be taken later in the evening. Tonight, the city clerk will be contacting speakers by telephone. Mr. Mejia. Bill Rattan, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin now. Mr. Rattan, are you there? Yes, I am. You may begin. Yes, I am Bill Rutan, a U.S. Army veteran and homeowner in Palm Springs for the past 27 years. In addition to the harm that the noise and concussion of some fireworks causes wildlife, including bighorn sheep and our own pets, I wish to discuss post-traumatic stress disorder among veterans, PTSD. Although I do not suffer from PTSD, I was subjected to mortar attack during my tour of duty in Vietnam, and I can tell you that the experience was terrifying. Please bear in mind that fireworks are, in fact, an explosion of gunpowder. In the descriptions that I have read, any explosive detonation can be a PTSD triggering event, especially if they are unexpected. Thus, I urge the city to eliminate or absolutely minimize the granting of permits for fireworks displays. Thank you. Thank you. Hello? Amato Salinas, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin now. Thank you. I want to point out and put the City uh, Council members on notice and the attorney that in 2012, the Frank Bogart statue was on property when the city council voted that that area for the city of Palm Springs was gonna be a historic preservation site. So I'm putting them on notice that now that they full know that that it's a federal state and city code that they're violating by pushing this through. So I don't know, you, I guess Coors and uh, Christy are gonna leave and leave a big financial mess for us residents here and the future city councils. That is terrible. They need to go ahead and realize we have laws, we have codes, and they purposely have directed the nonprofits to go ahead and write uh, comments to help them remove the statue, them meaning the city council, which is wrong. The majority of the residents here in Palm Springs want it, they love it, he was a giant of a man, a giant of a mayor, and a wonderful person. And these individuals that have come into the city have no knowledge whatsoever of this man, and yet they vote to go ahead and try to get his statue away for whatever cause they may or may not have. Currently, they need to follow the law. The city attorney has been put on notice. So what are we going to do to those that leave us that mess? Can they be held accountable, financially accountable for their actions? I think they should be. They should not be able to go ahead and use the system, start up the mess, and leave this financial burden for the city. Furthermore, we can't go ahead and pay for out of us our monies, any reparations for individuals that never loaned any and never owned any land in Section 41. That's ridiculous. 
that was a tribal issue and not a city issue on that part. So I think the city council and the members really need to reevaluate, put this aside and let the city attorney, city manager, uh, go ahead and review the policies and procedures that are currently in place that protect and preserve that area. Again, my name is Amado Salinas. I've been here since 1962 or 60, I forget, I'm old. So thank you. Lauren LeBaron, you are live yes. at the City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Mayor Middleton, Leader Pro Tem Garner, Council members and staff. My name is Lauren LeBaron and I'm a concerned resident of Palm Springs. I would like to urge you to cease allowing fireworks in the city of Palm Springs. Fireworks are a tradition that does much harm and should not be continued for the sake of nostalgia. There are excellent alternatives. Many of us with pets know firsthand how traumatic and terrifying fireworks are for our pets. Powerful fireworks came in sounds over 190 decibels and are louder than gunshots in some jet planes. Experts estimate that loud sounds, mainly fireworks and thunderstorms, make up one-fifth of all companion animal disappearances, which is evidenced by the high number of lost and stray pet intakes our public shelters experience every July 4th, including our Palm Springs shelter. Wildlife species are also traumatized by fireworks. Birds can become so frightened and disoriented that they leave their roost and fly into trees, poles, cars, and other objects, becoming severely injured or dying. Bighorn sheep, rabbits, coyotes, and other wildlife who call Palm Springs home are traumatized every time there's a fireworks display in our community. We have a collective responsibility to protect these species too. Fireworks can also trigger PTSD in individuals who are victims of gun violence or are brave soldiers who have served in combat. This is also well documented. It is time to move away from toxic, dangerous, and traumatizing entertainment to healthier, safe celebrations. <laughs> Thank you for your time and your consideration. Don Mills, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin now. Thank you. This is Don Mills addressing 5C, reading with permission my husband Chris Mills' letter. Dear Mayor and Council, having served as a Palm Springs City Council member from 2001 to 2017, I was present at the February 15, 2012 Council meeting where the City Hall site in its entirety was approved as a City Class 1 historic property. I have recently heard and read that the Bogert statue was deemed not a part of this designation simply not true. It was certainly a part of the conversation and considered a part of the site during the deliberation. How anyone could assume it was not a part of the site when we reviewed over and over the definition of site is beyond me. It was stated site included everything bound by the existing property lines of City Hall that simple. I was the sole dissenting vote that evening in that I felt it was also important to allow future flexibility in landscaping, parking, and circulation, including potential relocation of the Bogart statue. Whether I agree with the removal or relocation is not an issue with regard to this appeal. The fact that anyone, including city staff, could ascertain it was not a part of the site at the February 12, 2012 meeting vote is uninformed and totally ignorant of the proceedings that night. If you wish to relocate the statue, you should amend the class one designation as only the council can do, relying on the HSPB to make a determination as to whether the statue was part of the designation is not their responsibility when it was perfectly clear in the 2012 designation that it was part of the site. The same as every tree, shrub, light fixture, and piece of concrete or asphalt within the boundaries of City Hall. I'd like to add that the staff report referring to Bogart's statue as non-significant, equivalent to a sprinkler head, shows an obvious bias of the city staff regarding this issue. Thank you. Thank you. David Weiner, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. David Weiner, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. Good evening, City Council, Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. 
Um, I think, you know, I've, I've been involved with this effort along with a lot of other community members for a while. Um, people say that I'm just a tourist, even though I've been a homeowner and resident of Palm Springs for 17 years. And um, I'm just going to say, first of all, I want to applaud the city staff for their report and the diligence that they put into it. Um, and also the consultant's report that was used in reaching the decision to issue the certificate of appropriateness to, rem to move the statue. Um, I think it, it goes without saying that the consultants um, feel that, as many people do, the statue itself is not part of City Hall. And to be honest, I find it offensive that people consider it part of City Hall. City Hall was built in the 50s and 60s. The statue was added, uh, I think it was three decades later. And we need to own up as residents and, and the heirs of Palm Springs, I guess you'd say, um, to what happened and how we do need to make things right in the best way that we can. And I think moving this statue to a place is of, on, of not directly in front of City Hall is part of that effort. For those people that say that the statue is part of City Hall and must stay there because it's a historical um, site, um, I would yeah. say that by that same measure, you know, you just replaced the charging stations behind City Hall in the parking lot of City Hall that is on City Hall property. And I think we need to reconsider the removal or the replacement of those parking chargers and put the uh, old set chargers back. Obviously, that's an absurd, spurious argument, just as is the argument for not moving the statue to uh, a different place. Thank you so much for your time. Stephanie Martin, can you mute your TV? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Good. Sorry. Thank you. You are live with the city council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. Well, thank you. Yes, I'd like to speak on issue 5C. My name is Stephanie Martin with Quantum Consultations of Desert Hot Springs. Now, even considering any appeal for what is such a weak offering in the first place toward a restorative justice effort surrounding the removal or, I guess, relocation of the Frank Bogart statue in front of the City Hall in Palm Springs, is just complete denial, sheer utter denial. The racial inequalities and equity gaps found in the wavering on removing a person who didn't think twice prior to removing so many hardworking people and their families in the most cruel and permanent way possible can be witnessed today. And we need to do something about this. That, that's really equitable here. To burn down and destroy homes in the summer was a dirty play by Mr. Bogart as the mayor that needs to be rectified beyond the removal of or relocation of such a painful symbolic reminder in the form of a statue. To many, it is a shocking reminder when they go to do business that with Palm Springs that when the rest of the nation was fighting for civil rights, the mayor of Palm Springs at the time was acting in the opposite of these interests. I call for restorative justice and the permanent removal of the Frank Bogart statue from City Hall property and ask to consider even, you know, eye for eye, tooth for the tooth, melting and burning that statue down, a symbolic of the consequences of bigoted racist actions and shaky legacies gotten through unacceptable means. Uh, and and as, for, as far as uh, uh, the prior speaker this evening, I believe his name was Armado Salinas. It's not section 41, it's section 14. And it's it's a, a lot of those properties, you can see the, the destruction today. You can take a tour. There was a recent tour. It's Black History, Black Excellence Month. And we need to really honor the true roots and the legacies around here locally. I, I, I even want to see a Lauren Crossley statue in front of the city hall. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Rossi, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Uh, dear Mayor Middleton, Mayor Pro Temp Gardner, and City Council members, please let me introduce myself. I'm Dan Rossi. I'm the newly appointed Executive Director of the Palm Springs Animal Shelter, and I'm here to provide comment on the fireworks situation. Um, 
as you all know, this is a situation that has come up uh, prior to the council back in May and also in September. Uh, I'm here to uh, give my comment to um, really express our opposition to uh, firework display permits uh, that are provided. We understand that uh, there are a way to honor our veterans and things like that. We are okay with uh, permits uh, twice a year uh, to happen for 4th of July and uh, Veterans Day as well. Uh, we're asking that it be limited to only to that. Um, the uh, recent uh, materials that were given related to the uh, research of the uh, air quality is excellent, but please do not forget the impact that this also has on our domestic and wild animals. I can tell you that in the animal shelter, uh, we see an uptick of um, stray animals that come in uh, the day after firework displays happen. Animals get so fearful, they break out of their backyards, their houses, and uh, become strays. They get hit by cars, and they get displaced from their owners. It puts a taxing situation on the shelter, let alone the families that have to deal with this. Uh, animals uh, have to be medicated in their homes uh, from the fear of, of the fireworks displays as well, as well as the impact it has in the animal shelter as well. So please uh, take this situation seriously. We also need uh, better action when it comes to backyard fireworks as well, which are legal in uh, the Palm Springs uh, area as well and having those enforced. I uh, thank you for letting me uh, talk to this topic and I'm more than willing to discuss it further if uh, that is needed. Thank you. David Christian, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Middleton and city council members. Uh, my name is David Christian. I'm a 52 year resident of Palm Springs. And I, um, to this day, and despite city officials claiming to run a transparent government, the authors of the HRC's defamatory and dishonest report are still unknown. The city and the HRC have refused to disclose the report's authorship despite numerous requests by friends of Frank Bogert. I ask you again today, and in the interest of transparency, to Please disclose, disclose the authors of this report. It's caused so much divisiveness in our community. This fallacious report has been discredited by friends of, of Frank Bogert in a lengthy and extensively researched rebuttal. The resolution to adopt the report was voted down by this council. This is clearly a politically motivated attack on the former mayor and a public request Records request revealed communication between city officials that showed that a former city council member and a national political organization were involved in the production of the HRC's report. Even one of the HRC's own commissioners courageously spoke out against the political motivation, saying that the report gave the appearance of character assassination tactics to achieve a political goal. The the report and the city's efforts to remove the statue have been highly offensive to the indigenous Hogwa Caliente tribe as well. They're problem, prominent members of the tribal council, of tribal chairman rather, that have called the report disgusting and slanderous and asked the city to remove their families' names from the report. And finally, this city staff report and certificate of approval for, in regards to the HSPB issue is a clear violation of the 2010 action by the city council protecting that statue. It's just one more example of the botched, disingenuous, and non-transparent process to move, remove it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Scott Williams, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> My name is Scott Williams. Um, you know, I've been a, a resident of this valley since almost birth. Uh, I was born and almost born and raised here. Um, you know, and I've never, I've never really felt 
that uh, that 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 statue needed to come down. That's for sure. Um, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that the HS TV violated the terms and the protection previously granted to the Frank Bogart statue, and the HS TV should reconsider their decision. Therefore, the city should. City Council should not go forward with the reconsideration of the HSTV. Um, you know, I, I I just don't I don't understand it. Um, you know, this it's a, a huge part of our history here in this town, and uh, you know, if we if we we can look at it good or bad, um, but we need to remember it and learn from it and uh, continue forward. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Evans, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the city council and staff. My name is Doug Evans. Um, I, I woke up this morning quite early and I took a look at the newspaper. And the headline had to do with the city council's concerns about COD and transparency. Um, the Human Rights Commission report is an absolute classic case of non-transparent government. Uh, it was prepared by people. There's references to executive committee meetings that have not been able to be documented by staff or anybody. Um, a government report that has no authors should be removed from the public record. Uh, that said, um, I'd like to call your attention to section one, section of uh, section 805.010 of the Historic Preservation Ordinance. And it states, for the purpose of pre preserving areas and specific buildings in the city, which reflect elements of its cultural, social, economic, political, architectural, and archeological history. Clearly when the city council considers the history of Palm Springs, there is more to preservation than just bricks and mortar. The city council clearly added the Bogart statue to the class one designation in 2012. Uh, the statue is the most of the most famous mayor uh, in Palm Springs history was created by a world-class artist. It is a significant piece of the history and the time and the political environment of Palm Springs, whether it's viewed positive or negative. The statue is not a sprinkler head. It's insulting to have it referenced that way uh, or compared to a sprinkler head in the staff report. Uh, ARG in its report, chooses its very its words very carefully. As of January 20, um, January 2022, the statue has not been evalu evaluated for eligibility as a historic resource. Mr. Evans, your, of art Mr. Evans, your time is up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Gloria Thompson, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Mr. Evans is still talking. Uh, there is a little delay online. You may begin. Gloria Thompson. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm Gloria Thompson with uh, Palm Springs Section 14 Advisory Board. And I would like to speak on the uh, regarding the Frank Borgart statue. You may begin. I I heard that the historical society was appealing the decision to remove that statue. Uh, and and uh, I disapprove. And I approve of the removal of the statue. It really doesn't have any valuable history as far as I'm, uh, I'm concerned, except for the things that he did to our people on the reservation. That's all I know about him. And I would like to know of any suggestion where it was going to be moved because 
I was at a meeting with the historical site, and they wanted to move it downtown across the street from Las Consuelo, and that's just uh, insult to injury. So I, I, do, I would like for any appeals to be denied on moving the, the uh, statue and especially moving it downstairs. Uh, another thing, I, I heard someone comment about they have been here since 1962 and they agree with having a statue. And that's because they don't know the history of what this man did. They don't really know the, um, they didn't see the houses burning like I did and, and being bulldozed. So no, I, I do not honor that man. And I don't think anyone in my community does. So remove the statue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jerry Holland, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, greetings to everyone, uh, mayor, uh, city council people. My name is Gary Holland and I am a section 14 survivor. Uh, from the reservation back off in the 60s. Uh, I just want to uh, say that, you know, that, you know, as I was a child during this time and um, when everything was going on, I was totally unaware. But I do remember a lot of things that went on at that period, how people were scuffling and scrabbling and moving about to try and uh, rectify or understand what was happening. Um, I do remember that uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, we're talking about what went on uh, with section 14. Um, I, I, I remember uh, the time that, um, uh, when people were scrabbling around trying to figure out a place where they would go and where they were going to do later on as their homes were being torn down, you know, even though uh, we did not own the land, uh, uh, the Indians, they represented us and we represented them. Um, you know, there were hard times between the two uh the two nations or the two races um I, I didn't understand i think it was to me it was like fun times because as we were stacking on top of each other trying to figure out where we were going to stay and people were um you know running here and there uh we we all looked out for each other and um Mr. Holland, i just want to your time is up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bobby Gray, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you. Can I start now? Yes, you may begin. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Bobby Gray. I am a lifelong resident of the Coachella Valley and would like to comment regarding my support of the Frank Borg statue. I would like to start by saying the Section 14 fiasco was not caused by Frank Bogart. Mr. Bogart assisted the landowners who were the members of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Two Agua Caliente families, those of former Chairman Richard Milanovic and former Chairman Pete Siva, submitted comments to the City Council addressing their lifelong friendship with Frank Bogart. Former Vice Chairman, Chairwoman of the Tribal Council, Barbara Gonzalez Lyons, described the benefits of the city and tribe of working together to help the tribe become financially independent. Former Tribal Chairman Richard Milanovic described Frank Borg as the city's first luminary. Former Mayor Ron Oden became a friend of Frank Borg during his decade of being on the city council and mayor and was not wanted he raised any issues or state or say any concerns regarding the statue being removed. I believe Frank Bogart to be worthy of a place of honor in the history of this wonderful city and urge the council to support the preservation of his memory. Thank you very much for your considerations. Thank you. 
Susan Smith, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin now. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor uh, Middleton and uh, Council members. Um, I uh, sent a letter today that I hope you'll read. I, I'll, I'll just briefly uh, go over my points. Um, I think that the um, Mayor Bogert uh, memorial sculpture needs to stay where it is at City Hall. The man uh, helped incorporate the city in 1938. He devoted 75 years of his life towards this city to create what it is today between the airport, the convention center, and so many other uh, major developments. Um, he was focused and he got things accomplished and he was a friend to all people. He was married to a Latino, his widow still lives in Palm Springs, and his first wife who died from cancer is Jewish. So for those who say that he was a bigot or a racist, that's entirely false. And the fact is that we can live with one another with um, both new and old. Take, for example, the El Mirador Hotel Tower. The hospital built an annex and several annexes that are quite modern, yet we preserved the El Mirador Tower. Um, the old desert museum at Talkwitz and Indian was uh, featured the Cornelia White House at the corner of uh, Indian and and Talkwitz, and um, that was moved to the Village Green. So that was preserved. There are many examples of um, preserved sites in Palm Springs, and um, there's no reason at all to uh, remove Frank Bogert's uh, sculpture there. Um, the reparation situation, um, we're reminded that 351 families of white uh, families of two or more as compared to 115 uh, people of color uh, were situated on the tri tribal land dirt. Thank and you, Susan. Your, your time is up. Okay. Brad Ward, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin now. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Brad Ward. I'm a coach and, con and consultant in Palm Springs. Um, on Veterans Day, was the first incident of fireworks after our dog show began to show signs of anxiety. I was unaware there were fireworks happening at all, let alone that there that our house was so close to the location that they would be uh, exploding in our window practically. Um, the entire time the fireworks uh, occurred, I was sitting with a dog who decompensated further and further with each explosion. I couldn't comfort him, nor could I protect him from what was going on outside. As I sat with him, my mind turned to human beings. And as a, as a trauma-informed certified coach, I'm trained to recognize and respond to human trauma within the scope of my practice. And knowing how, dis, how, dis, uh, how debilitating trauma can be for some people, it compels me to oppose fireworks sponsored by the city of Palm Springs. Post-traumatic stress injury, also known as post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, responses are involuntary. Veterans, people who have lived through war and people who have survived gun violence, may carry traumatic responses for years, even after they work through it. Because of the extreme noise, bright flash, and rapid succession of fireworks, people who have had who have autism or other diagnoses of neurodiversity can experience overwhelm in a, in a fireworks display, putting them into a state that may be dangerous and debilitating for their health. Consider, if it were you, what, would, what adverse reaction, and you had an adverse reaction to something that was optional, what would you want your city to do? For the sake of respecting and honoring the humanity of those who suffer from the effects of fireworks, I urge you to ban fireworks in the city of Palm Springs. Thank you. Thank you. Sue Lefevre, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments. Thank you for this opportunity. Good evening, council members. My name is Susan Lefevre. I've been in the desert since 1968, went to high school here. Um, and even though I spent most of my time in the east end of the valley, I absolutely saw what Frank Bogart did to the west end of the valley. There wouldn't be a Palm Springs without him. Um, I've heard the, the testimony of other of our members or uh, 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 locals who have 
commented and I agree wholeheartedly. So now I just want to kind of give some credence also to other, you know, some technical reasons why the statue should remain other than the fact that he is a, an historical figure that deserves a spot in our community. Um, I would like to see that the council, I would respectfully request that they issue a continuance on the appeal of the HSPB certificate of approval or remove the item from the agenda altogether. And the reason is that the staff report on this matter is incomplete. It does not address the concerns brought up by the Historical Society back in November. Um, that it attempts, the staff report attempts to limit the scope of the certification in order to ensure a certain outcome. So despite the Historical Society asking the city staff to do so, the certification, the certification of approval does not assess the value of the statue as an historical artifact. So in short, I would like the appeal letter from Mr. Pacheco as stated that it, it needs to be fixed before it is removed. Um, he's undeniably, Frank Bogart, uh, an historical figure of great importance to this community, and uh, no man has done more to put the little village of Palm Springs on the international map. So please, City Council, conduct a fair and transparent process that doesn't skew a certain outcome. Please objectively evaluate the value of this statue as requested, please continue the appeal and direct staff to prepare a historic resource evaluation on the statue, its renowned artist, and on Mayor Frank Bogart himself. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Norm King, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you. I'm Norm King and a friend of Frank. First, Frank Bogart was not in any sense a racist. The attempt to discredit Frank Bogart's reputation based on the city's involvement in Section 14 belies the historical record. The city would never have gotten involved in Section 14 if the Tribal Council, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the County Health Department had not requested and urged the city's assistance. The city council apparently wants to pretend that such historical record does not exist. Secondly, I respect our city staff, and it hurts me to have to say the following. The Preservation Board's direction to staff made it their November meeting has not been honored, and the staff has misrepresented the ARG consultant report. Specifically, in November, the board directed the staff to initiate an historic resources assessment report, quote, to provide further information about the historic significance of City Hall site and the Bogart statue. This was not done. The ARG consultant report states, quote, the statue has not been evaluated for eligibility as a historic resource. This study does not, still continuing the quote, does not evaluate the Bogart statute under any eligible criteria. In spite of this, the staff report states, the report concluded that the Bogart statute, statute does not contribute to the historic significance of City Hall. This statement is a blatant fabrication of the text of the consultant report that the city paid for. Furthermore, the city report states, quote, the statute was not mentioned in the city council resolutions that designated City Hall as a historic class one site. This is not true. It is clear that the 2012 resolution amended the historic designation to include the structures, features, and the land that includes the entire Cockwood Canyon frontage, excepting only the landscape plant materials. The 2012 resolution also states that all existing or previously approved or installed alterations or improvements should be considered acceptable and consistent with the requirements for class one status. This information was not provided to the board. All of the above demonstrates that the Bogart statue, contrary to the staff effort to rewrite history, is included in the class one designation. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Steve Braff, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Middleton and the council for this opportunity to speak on 5C and urge that we keep Frank Bogart statue at city hall. I'm a 19 year resident of Palm Springs. We all know in Palm Springs that modernism is king. But from our, from our earliest days, prior to cityhood, through the 60s, it was Spanish architecture with a rustic Western theme. That was what was most popular. The equestrian lifestyle was the thing. 
movie stars came to the desert to swim and sunbathe, play tennis and ride horses. They participated in one of the biggest events of the day, the Desert Circus and the Desert Circus Parade. They proudly rode their horses down Palm Canyon Drive. The stars loved it. The crowds loved it. You can see their joy in the old photos. There were Western stores on Palm Canyon, barbecues, hay rides, and trail rides that the rich and famous enjoyed side by side with the locals. And of course, Frank Bogart. Has our preservation board forgotten or are they choosing to ignore our past? Mid-century modern homes were once considered so passé, you could hardly give away an Alexander house. Fashions change. Our history does not. The Frank Bogart statue is both a tribute to the man and an important reminder of what old Palm Springs once was a town where residents and tourists alike loved and enjoyed our Western theme. I urge our leaders to please reconsider their support for all things modern and be responsible stewards of the whole of our city's long and rich history. The Frank Bogart statue deserves historic preservation where it stands in front of City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Marjorie Holland, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Marjorie Holland. I'm calling on behalf of Desert Holland Gateway Wellness Committee and Palm Springs Section 14 survivors. Uh, this statue is offensive to many people, people who have played and continue to play major roles in making Palm Springs, California, the world-class resort that it is. Take it down store it. Figure out a less offensive location in the same manner, meetings, debates, discussions that we're doing now, if such a location exists. Having a new home should not delay the statue's removal. It has been concluded that the statue's removal does not affect City Hall's value as a historical monument. Wherever it ends up, it will be offensive to some. Thank you. Jana Hayes, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to begin or to give your comments and you may begin. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jana Hayes. I'm a retired Marine Corps veteran and a volunteer at the Palm Springs Animal Shelter. I am calling to lend my voice to the continuing debate over fireworks displays by the city and permitted events. Last year, to my knowledge, it was determined that a compromise had been reached that fireworks were to be sanctioned for two major holidays, the 4th of July and Veterans Day. Now we are considering that other events be permitted to have a fireworks display. None of the objections to fireworks have abate, abated. They remain a hazard to the public and in specific to veterans, especially those among our homeless population, many of whom suffer from PTSD. In addition, the harm to pets and wildlife are well documented and are as relevant today as they were a year ago. To broaden fireworks displays, to other events besides the two mentioned above is not in the best interest of the city and actually tarnishes our reputation as a forward thinking and humane place to live. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Benny Mayfield, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Yes, thank you very much, Mayor and City Council uh, members. Uh, my name is Ben Mayfield, graduate of Palm Springs High School, 1971. Um, I grew up in Palm Springs uh, since 1954 and uh, left Palm Springs uh, after college at the desert. Um, concerning Mr. Bogart, that behavior 
shouldn't be and cannot be awarded or tolerated. Um, there's probably some great things that uh, Mayor Bogart did, and there's some pretty bad things that he did. Now, concerning the statue, yes, it should be removed from City Hall. Now, we speak of equestrians. I heard a gentleman talk about the horses, the parades, and so forth. I used to ride horses at the Spokes Street Stables on the weekends. I think there were $5 horse rides at that time. I think that would be a good location for the statue uh, over at the stables. It shouldn't be where Palm Springs, I'm looking, matter of fact, I did it today. It says Palm Springs have 1.6 million people per year visiting Palm Springs. Right now, they probably don't see the statue. It's out at City Hall. So why would one want to move it in the center of, center of Palm Springs where then they would see the statue on a daily basis? That's pretty much what I have to say. And there's going to be a lot of rhetoric, how great he was. But at the same time, for my people, he was not great. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate the uh, call. Thank you. Thank you. Tristan Milanovic, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Good evening, City Council. This is Tristan Milanovic, daughter of the late Tribal Chairman Richard Milanovic. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Milanovic family alone. We are extremely disappointed on the Council's continued discussions of the removal of Mayor Frank Bogart's statue at the entrance of City Hall. As I've stated numerous times in the past, Frank was not a racist man. My father's incredible admiration for Frank and their deep, long-lasting friendship was a testament to that. Additionally, it must be stated how disgusted the family is that the city council is still considering a letter from a commission that has continued to use my father's name even after the request of removal from the tribe and the family themselves. We do not wish to be a part of a movement of pandering and virtue signaling. Your efforts of political correctedness have proven to be false as you allow a deceased Native American man's name, my father's name, to be drugged through the mud, all for the sake of your agenda. And even more as you sit upon my ancestors' stolen land, my family's stolen land. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Julie Bueller, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you so much. My name is Julie Bueller. And I was, I have to say, I spent decades as an award-winning sports journalist with actually more than a decade here locally in the Coachella Valley in radio, television, and print. In fact, I'm really proud to say that because of our community, I got to be the first woman in California history to host primetime sports talk radio. That's the kind of glass ceiling shattering only possible with outstanding community support. And that's why I know what's possible when this community, you on the council, and the community around us throw our support behind a cause. And that's why I'm asking you to do so tonight for our beloved Palm Springs Power baseball organization. The most incredible thing I got to witness in all those years of sports broadcasting was the numerous times the powerful and galvanizing effect of sports can have on a community. The profound life lessons learned on a baseball diamond have impacted world leaders, presidents, shaped generations, and today still mold young minds in a way few other cultural institutions can. And that is why I strongly support the Palm Springs Power Baseball team. They are vital to our community. And the annual fireworks show is a rare opportunity for those previously may maybe uninterested in baseball to enjoy the historic Palm Springs Stadium and connect to their community in a new, wonderful way. And I'm sure we can all recognize that is an invaluable gift to enriching a life. So I implore you all and strongly urge anyone hoping to unite and mend our community to throw your full weight and force behind supporting the Palm Springs Power Baseball Organization and reinstate the annual fireworks show at Palm Springs Stadium to celebrate the 4th of July, celebrate baseball, America, and this phenomenal community. Thank you so much for your attention to this matter. Delia, can you mute your TV, please? Yes, I just did. Thank you. Delia Ruiz, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments, and you may begin. Thank you. My name is Delia Ruiz. I was born in Palm Springs in 1951 and raised in Section 14 until about 1964, when we were forced out of the home that my father built with his hard-earned money. 
I'd like to say, please keep those of us who are harmed greatly by the actions under Frank Bober's leadership of the housing destruction on Section 14 in mind. He was not only racist, he was also homophobic. We are in favor of taking the statue down. Thank you. Donna Sturgeon, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Thank you so much, Donna Sturgeon. Um, I'd just like to speak out on behalf of uh, the, the uh, 5C, the uh, Frank Bogart statue removal. Um, I just feel uh, quite strongly that um, Mr. Bogart provided so much to the city. His contributions are uh, bigger than, than building an airport or building or a tramway. Um, it's what he left us. It's, uh, it's a young cowboy who really developed the city. Um, there are there are no indications uh, to, to my mind that he has done anything but lift up this community uh, in his role as mayor and as a resident. So that is uh, that is my my contribution. Thank you. Andrew Stark, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Andrew Starkey and I am the president of Power Baseball. We've been hosting our opening day fireworks shows dating back to 2005. This tradition is a celebration not only for the start of a new season of your one and only hometown team, but a community first event put on for the residents and the fans. All of our winter and summer games, this like all of our winter and summer games, this event in particular is a family-friendly event with more kids than you can imagine. Thousands of people enjoy the show from within Palm Springs Stadium, but even more enjoy the show from Sunrise Park, Palm Springs High School, and the surrounding neighborhoods. One of our partners, Eisenhower Medical Center, has been hosting their employee appreciation picnic with us on opening day since 2013. Once again, they're ready to thank their frontline employees and families by allowing us to host this event for them. Today, in a conversation with Marty Masiello, the CEO of Eisenhower Medical Center, he encouraged me to reference our conversation and express his strong support for the city of Palm Springs to allow us to celebrate our 2022 season opener with another professionally run firework display. Thus, I am asking the city council to allow Power Baseball to once again go through the set process to keep our opening day firework display on the approval list. Thank you for your time and consideration, and please put the residents and children first, as our display is for thousands of them that can for the thousands of them that can talk to us and tell us how much they enjoy the display. Thank you. Keith Zabel, you are live with the City Council and you have two minutes to provide your comments. You may begin. Great, thank you. Good evening, City Council. My name is Keith Zabel and I'm a resident of the Palm Springs Sunmore neighborhood. I'm calling to lend my voice to the community debate over the fireworks within our city. I was of the understanding this matter had been resolved through compromise by allowing fireworks only on two holidays, July 4th and Veterans Day. And while fireworks evoke wonderful memories of my youth, as an adult, I've come to realize their danger to people, animals, and the environment. And we share our community with a multitude of animals, in particular, our domesticated pets, wildlife, and many community cats. Fireworks cause all these animals extreme anxiety, sudden fear, which causes them to flee their homes in order to escape the noise. And this can result with them being disoriented and subsequently lost. And some in the process get killed by coyotes in vehicles. Fireworks should continue to be limited to the two already approved holidays. Other events and holidays can choose alternative visual displays that do not involve explosions. Thank you so much for your time. Janelle Hunt, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to give your comments and you may begin. Good evening. My name is Janelle Hunt and I would like to share my thoughts about item 5C, the removal of the Frank Boger statue. It amazes me the audacity of people never seems to amaze me. Here we are tonight with an agenda item, the removal of the Frank Boger statue yet again. And an agenda item that people would rather utilize resources to stop Google up an agency, an, an agenda item that was voted to be removed, but yet here we are again. 
I just don't understand why. Why must, why must we as descendants and survivors and the survivors and keep having to retell their stories to help provide a visual of a man, Frank Boger, who was the mayor of this city. The city of Palm Springs, a city where a mayor is responsible for the safety of the city, the city's citizens. A mayor is to oversee the public service departments such as police and fire. A mayor has the right and the authority to close public buildings and areas deemed unsafe because of damage. A mayor who orders the evacuation and present transportation plans when necessary, as it was stated in the article titled, What is the Mayor's Responsibility For? If these are the duties of a mayor, can you honestly say Frank Bogart, along with his other fellow city council members, did what was best for the residents of Section 14? I guess the history of Palm Springs can be a little foggy for those who were and still remain entitled. Our city has an ugly past. Then why not eradicate everything that has that has been tied to an ugly past so that so what do you think of that Frank Boger statue? Well, it needs to go. A statue that stands in front of a government building, a government building that is supposed to represent all cities of the city of Palm Springs, including those that lived on Section 14. Frank Bogart, I don't care how you look at it, played a role in uplifting families, my family, and many other people's families, children, and people in the and people having to lose their personal belongings. Thank you, Janelle. Your time is up. Uh, oh. Dottie Wilder, you are live with the City Council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. Hi, my name is Dottie Wilder. Um, and uh, my comment is, I don't know what figure could be any more historical in Palm Springs than Frank Bogart and a horse. Um, and certainly when I came to Palm Springs, he gave me something to identify with and uh i love horses as well and uh and all the many uh, uh events he he either set up or took part in arranged for people to enjoy um and the many years he was a visible person in the desert to me there's nobody more historical so i think it, the statue should remain where it is and that's my comment thank you Madam Mayor, that concludes the public comment, and we were able to reach everyone who wished to speak. Uh, thank you, and that was done beautifully, and uh, we appreciate uh, all of the comments that we heard from uh, everyone in our community. Uh, it uh, In Palm Springs, we expect to hear uh, from our residents, from uh, our neighbors, and we do and thank you. Uh, next, it is City Council Subcommittee and City Manager reports and comments. Uh, is there anyone on council who would like to uh, provide a report? Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the BRAF program, Building Resilience in African American Communities. They held their Living African American Museum this weekend, which was basically uh, their students, these young students between about 11 to 13 years old, who embodied their um, African American ancestors and civic leaders. We saw John Lewis. Uh, we saw African kings, uh, sports stars. It was just everyone that you could think of was represented by these children. And it was absolutely stunning. You, you, They had visual displays. They were dressed in costume. It was incredibly moving. And I just want to make sure that um, Tanea and all of the team over at BRAF know how important it is that we have events like this. And I am just very grateful to have attended. And I hope that um, next year, every one of us can, can go. It was really not to be missed. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Well, let me add just a couple of things. Uh, one, I want to thank everyone associated with uh, Modernism Week for all of the work that you have done uh, over the last uh, uh, week and uh, the incredible number of visitors that have come to our city and gotten an opportunity to uh, enjoy the iconic architecture uh, of our community. And we look forward to having you back again next year. Uh, to visit and hopefully with uh, a fewer restrictions that uh, have to be in place. Uh, on a personal note, uh, at uh, the February uh, CalPERS Board of Administration meeting, I was uh, reelected to be the chair of the Risk and Audit Committee uh, and was elected to be the chair of the Finance and Administration Committee. Uh, it is the Finance and Administration Committee uh, that is responsible for holding hearings and uh, making recommendations regarding the rates uh, that individuals will pay. Uh, that's not the only responsibility they have, but it is certainly one that's near and dear uh, to all of us in municipal government. Is there anyone else uh, from council? Uh, council Member Woods. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, the mayor for your talk about Texas and trans uh, trans transgender children. Thank you very much. I fully support those comments that you made. They were very articulate. Um, I just want to say that the, um, uh, the CB Sync, which is a traffic signal synchronization project down Highway 111 and Ramon is continuing to move forward. We did a groundbreaking of that um, several months ago. Uh, it's continuing to move forward, but the glory about this will be that it will <clears throat> hopefully be a backbone infrastructure for bringing better uh, internet access to the city. I will hopefully, I've been asked for a report and I will hopefully have more details on that coming up next month that I can report out to the council and the public. Um, I wanted, um, uh, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem said, I wanna give a shout out uh, to three neighborhoods in District 2, El Rancho Vista Estates, Sagewood HOA, and the Little Tuscany Neighborhood Organization. All three of those organizations have uh, painstakingly put together home tours for Modernism Week, which they opened their homes um, for tours from out of town, as well as those from in town. It not only creates a sense of neighborhood and community and brings people together, but it also showcases our city on a much broader basis. Um, Sagewood and Little Tuscany have already hosted theirs. El Rancho Vista Estates will be Friday, or excuse me, will be February 26th, and there are still tickets available if anyone wants to buy them through the Modernism website. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Holstich. Thank you so much, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I have a few announcements and then a few comments and requests. Um, one, I'm holding my District 4 Town Hall on March 2nd at 4 p.m. on Zoom. So anyone in the city or not even in, in the city is welcome to attend those. And uh, we respond to community questions um, and get city staff and others um, to, to answer your questions. And I'm always happy to answer questions too. So it should be a good forum. We're doing those quarterly now. Um, so I hope everyone can attend. Um, I also uh, chair, as the council knows, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, our homeless committee. Um, and so just for this council and the public, um, we had a meeting on Wednesday, February 16th. Those meetings are open to the public and they are on Zoom now. So you don't need to drive to Palm Desert and back uh, if you're a Palm Springs resident. Um, and there's a a few things I just want to flag for the council. One, Lift to Rise, which is a nonprofit uh, working on a plan to facilitate 10,000 units of affordable housing in the Coachella Valley in 10 years. Um, they're working on a housing catalyst fund, um, a way to help fund projects that are stalled because um, cities lack resources or redevelopment was taken away or affordable housing developers can't access financing like bridge financing or gap financing or something like that. So they're building a catalyst fund um, and they've already catalyzed, um, I think, 500 units across the Coachella Valley. 
um, and they've deployed 3.5 million in loan funding. Um, the county of Riverside is uh, granting $2 million to this fund. Um, and I just wanted to flag it for the council. And there was discussion I asked at that meeting how cities might be able to help this fund. As we, we frequently invest, you know, project by project by project. Um, but this is an opportunity to hold money in a fund and then leverage those funds to help. Um, multiple affordable housing projects, um, if that makes sense. So say the, you know, 5 million that we've invested in affordable housing projects, um, you know, over the last few years could be held in a fund and then reused um, to fuel other development, if that makes sense. And I'm describing that accurately. Um, so I just wanted to, I think it's a really interesting idea for council to be aware of, of regional efforts on affordable housing. Um, and as we look at our budget, and even how we're holding some of our money in terms of reserves or other, you know, additional um, funding we may receive, um, if we might want to think about, you know, how to hold those funds or help support this catalyst fund, as we know we need hundreds and thousands of more units um, throughout the valley. Um, there's also in that meeting a uh, CV Housing First 2021 Year in Review staff report, um, and I'd urge the council and the community to read that um, and see what our CV Housing First is doing. Just for the community, um, though you don't see a shelter or housing beds in the city of Palm Springs, we are part of a regional Housing First program, which is housing people. We're doing a CV 200 uh, by name list of chronically homeless folks in the Coachella Valley um, and working to get them housed. Um, so I just wanted to flag uh, for the committee and the council and the community um, that that program has housed 75 people of those 200 people um, in the year 2021. And remember, these are the hardest uh, to house folks with chronic illnesses and other um, difficulties. Um, and so really exciting progress. Um, and nearly all of those stayed housed for keep, keeping them, keeping track of what happens to them on the back end too, and not just counting temporary housing housing is housed. Um, so really exciting progress. Um, and you can look and see sort of those, how those um, numbers break down. Um, so we're working to repopulate the list um, and then also think through, you know, how else to provide services and housing services to people who are homeless. Um, so people always ask us what we're doing on homelessness. Um, and so I wanted to provide that update. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to say thank you to Anthony, our city clerk. Um, I just want to take a minute. You have been such an incredible city clerk. It's been such a pleasure to serve with you. Um, I came on and was elected did, you know, right before you started and you swore uh, me and Lisa in and actually the first LGBTQ city council in the country, um, by the way, and you've sworn in a lot of firsts that our city has elected. Um, and I've just been so impressed by your leadership, especially moving to districts um, and how engaged you were with our residents and how much our residents just truly love you. And you've been such an integral leader in our organization organization and in our entire community. And we are so, so sad to lose you, but so um, supportive of your career continuing to grow and flourish. And we know that you are really a statewide and national leader and city clerk organizations and associations. And we know your career is just getting started. So we're here to support you for whatever you need and just really grateful to the, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of hours that you've dedicated to Palm Springs residents and all the progress we've made um, over the last four and five years. So thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Councilmember Holstead, and thank you, Council. Um, last, I just wanted to thank the mayor for her incredibly powerful and personal statements um, about what is happening and frankly, not just in Texas, but across this country to see the trans community under attack is horrific. Um, and I'm just truly proud of, of Mayor Middleton. Um, I'm glad to call her a friend for her leadership and her voice. 
um, in this effort. And you're an incredible mayor. Um, and to be the first transgender mayor um, sworn in in the country and to be able to speak out um, on behalf of Palm Springs and Palm Springs residents, where we do want to lead the way for diversity and inclusion, and we do want to be a safe haven for the trans community. Um, I just want to thank you for adding to your voice because I know it's personal and difficult to share that story. Last, um, I just wanted to ask for an agenda item. So as the council knows, I have been working um, for almost a year uh, on with mayors for a guaranteed income. The city council um, passed a resolution in support of mayors for a guaranteed income and the city um, supporting those efforts. Um, I have had numerous, numerous conversations with uh, dozens of service providers throughout the region. Council Member Kors has joined me on a lot of those conversations, um, and we finally found a provider in the city of Palm Springs who's willing to do a pilot program, willing and able, because the able is the hard part, um, to do a pilot program. Uh, for a guaranteed income. Um, and DAP Health, excuse me, <coughs> DAP Health, um, leading on all the work they do for the LGBTQ community and all the health services that they provide to our community, excuse me, hold on, is working with Queer Works, a trans-led organization, um, to build out a pilot program to support the trans community. So they've submitted a budget request to me, which I'd like the city council to agendize and consider their budget request for the city to fund them building out a pilot program. It would be the first pilot program to support the trans community in the country. Sorry, hold on. I think it's an incredible opportunity to support DAP Health and Queer Works and all the work that they've done and really show how to support the trans community in a city like ours. So I'd like to ask that we agendize that for an upcoming meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Olsted. And uh, your voice is better than uh, two days ago, but uh, obviously it has its limits. So take care of yourself. Are there any other council member? Uh, council Member Kors. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you so much for your comments. Um, so important right now. Um, I guess it's a question because I know we're going to talk about how we add things to the agenda later tonight uh, for the city manager. So um, we want council, right? I think it's going to be a majority of council to add something to the agenda. And my understanding working on this is it's just it's a funding request, not work for staff um, to start this project so they can get the state funding and grants that the state's approved $35 million for. So how do we do that? Is that something we do as a motion? What would what would you like to decide if we're adding it to the agenda, I guess is my question. So I do think it's appropriate during the section for future agenda items to introduce uh, again, um, this, this now you've had some time to consider it over the course of the meeting um, and with any majority uh, really either by formal vote or simple direction from council, we'll place out on an agenda. Okay, thank you. I'll save my comments for then. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, Mr. Clifton, do you or anyone else from staff have any comments? Not this evening, Mayor, thank you. Okay. Uh, then the next uh, item that we have is to act on the uh, consent uh, calendar. No items were pulled. I will entertain a motion uh, to uh, accept the, to approve the consent calendar. Motion to approve. Council second. Motion, we have a second. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstedge. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Then our next item is a public hearing item. Uh, it is one that we needed to take as close to 7 p.m. as we could, and we're uh, getting in under the wire at 7.22. Uh, I, item 2A, a public hearing regarding redistricting of city council boundaries, adoption of a boundaries map, and introduction of an ordinance. 
Uh, staff report, please. Uh, Madam Mayor and City Council, just give me one second, I'm sorry. Uh, Honorable Mayor and City Council, tonight I am uh, joined by our attorney, Jim Priest, uh, and the elections expert. Uh, this is our fourth public hearing on the redistricting process and presented for your consideration are maps L and K. The maps only differ as it relates to the old Las Palmas neighborhood. Under map K, the District 3 boundary meets District 5 at the Alejo Road and North Palm Canyon Drive. Alternatively, map L extends District 3 boundary to West uh, Tacquitz Canyon Way and Palm Canyon Drive, ensuring that the Old Los Palmas neighborhood is not split between two districts. Otherwise, both maps ensure that the Lawrence Crossley neighborhood is within District 1, moves the Sunmore neighborhood from District 3 to District 1, maintains a majority minority district within District 1, and are within the deviation range of 6.9 or 7.6. If desired, I can pull up either of the maps, and Jim Priest and I are available for questions. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mejia, uh, we've got some very slight modifications in districts one, two, and three, in one and three. Is Are there any modifications in districts two, four, or five from the present map? Oh, let me take a look. And I ask because people are pretty familiar with what we have right now. Yes. It's a good so record. in the uh, district, in district two and district one, the Amico Street area in the Gene Autry neighborhood was previously in district one and that Amico Street area is now moving into uh, district two. Uh, but other than that, uh, Lawrence Crossley, uh, the Old Los Palmas neighborhood and the Gene Autry neighborhood and Sunmore are the ones that are being impacted. All right and no other residents uh, are impacted then? Correct. Okay. Uh, you know, not to cut Mr. Priest short, but we've had a lot of conversation on this. Uh, if, is there anything you definitely wanted to say, uh, Mr. Priest, or uh, can I move directly to uh, ask uh, council member questions? No, certainly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. I have nothing really additional to add to Mr. Mejia's presentation. And so uh, if you'd like to move to council deliberations, I'm available for questions. If you have any. Are there any questions for Mr. Priest or for staff? Council member or Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. I just want to ask a clarifying question um, that I uh, about Arnico because we I had asked if we could include the Arnico into District 1 again, and I know that our city clerk has an answer for why that wasn't possible, so you could share that. Certainly. So uh, in analyzing those uh, two census blocks, there's approximately 206 residents <laughs> uh, in that area, and that is being used to balance the deviation level uh, in District 2. If we were to uh, revert back, uh, we would be at a deviation level above 10%. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure the public was aware of that since it was discussed last time. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments or questions from uh, council for staff or Mr. Priest? Seeing none, uh, at this time, I would like to open the public hearing. The public is invited to speak on the public hearing for up to two minutes. If there are other speakers, the applicant will be invited to provide a two minute rebuttal. Where are the applicants so that that will be unnecessary. So, uh, Mr. Mejia, do we have any public comment? We do and we'll uh, reach Mr. David Friedman in just one moment. Okay. Mr. Friedman, you are live with the city council. You have two minutes to provide your comments and you may begin. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Middleton, Mayor Pro Tem Garner, and Council Members. My name is David Friedman. I would like to thank staff, and particularly Mr. Mejia and the demographer, for making the changes in maps K and L that I suggested in the public hearing two weeks ago. I support map L with the new boundaries of the old Las Palmas neighborhood as best reflecting Council's goal to keep organized neighborhoods intact to the extent practical and urge adoption of map L by City Council. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, do we have any other public comment? That concludes public comment. All right. Uh, there being no other speakers, the public uh, hearing is now closed. Is there discussion uh, or additional questions from council? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner and then council member Kors. Thank you. Um, it's really good to see us being able to move through this this um, process and I think these maps look good. I did wanna point out that one of our other maps that was submitted by the public did have um, over 50% um, CVAP numbers for to make a minor, um, majority minority district. Um, and I think that was just overlooked last time. So just wanted to raise that up. I think the options that we have in front of us are great and we should move forward with discussing them. But I just wanted to say that we just kind of missed that one little thing when we were talking about it last time. I didn't want to have that overlooked. And that was map I, I believe. Uh, council member Coors and then council member Holstich. Sure, um, just want to share, um, you know, I support map L, right? One of our sort of four priorities was to the extent we could to keep neighborhoods together. The boundaries of all those pomace uh, changed. Um, since our first map, it's 80 people, so it still keeps us uh, well within the allowed deviation. And uh, I think the neighborhood organization wants to welcome the 80 new members in and have them have the same representative. So at neighborhood meetings, et cetera, that works. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and I think there's more discussion, but I'm happy to make a motion at any point. The mayor would like. Uh, Council Member Holstich. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on Mayor Pro Tem Garner's point um, because I believe I checked with the city clerk and there was some correction there that it wasn't a true majority minority district. Is that right, city staff? I'm I'm sorry, for which which map? I. I. Um, map I, I think it was based on the actual voting age population versus the overall population. Is that right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to refer to Jim Priest because he has the, perhaps he has the map in front of him. You're muted, Mr. Priest. I'm trying to pull up map I with the demographics right now. Um, Thank you. And I'm not sure it's, uh, I think it's a moot point since we're not considering that map right now. I just wanted to say for the record, I talked to the city clerk and there are a number of, there was a map, map F. Um, I think that definitely had, um, it looked like it would create a majority minority district, but then it did not based on the total number. So um, I thought that was the map that count, that Mayor Pro Tem Garner was referring to. And I wasn't sure if that was the same case, um, but thank you. I think it was just a yeah. point for the record. We don't need to look it up. Thank you. Oh, okay. But I, I do have it in front of me. If uh, For map I, uh, District 1 has a non-white CVAP of 46%. So it, even though the total population uh, may have exceeded, uh, it's in the 66% range, those who are actually eligible to vote uh, would be under a minority, would be under 50%. Thank you, Mr. Mejia. And so that's for that reason why I didn't support that map. Uh, Council Member Kors, would you like to make your motion? Sure. Noting how appropriate it is that we're doing district maps on um, Anthony's uh, last meeting, um, given his unbelievable work uh, in getting us 
very similar maps uh, just a few years ago. Uh, that's really makes this especially uh, a nice occasion. And with that, I'd like to move um, map L forward as uh, the map that uh, we adopt. Is there a second for that motion? Council member Woods. Uh, and any further discussion? Uh, Council member Woods. Um, I'd just like to make a clarification and um, Anthony or uh, Jim Priest, maybe you can do it. Um, with the map that's proposed for the public, uh, the Amico chap, uh, the Amico track, which, which is uh, Gene Autry will stay in um, two, will be moved to two to make that neighborhood whole. And then the Whitewater district um, will be moved from um, district two to district one. If I could just add, and I think I would get seconded on this by Council Member Holstitch, that uh, I am very pleased to be able to continue to represent uh, all of the neighborhoods that are enclosed in currently in District 5, and that we don't have to make even a single change uh, in, uh, in that map is very pleasing. Uh, roll call, please. And Madam, uh, Madam Mayor, before we take the roll call vote, let me just clarify that the motion this evening is to move map L and introduce the ordinance that's attached to the staff report that will incorporate map L uh, per your direction. Thank you. Uh, and are we gonna need to read this after the- Yes, uh, I will. Okay. Uh, Council Member Cordes? Yes. Council Member Woods? Yes. Council Member Holstitch? Yes. Mayor Pro Tim Gardner? Yes. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Motion passes five to zero, and I'll read the ordinance title, which is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Springs, California, amending Palm Springs Municipal Code Section 2.02.005B regarding by district elections, adjusting the boundaries of City Council election districts, and confirming such revised City Council district boundaries as reflected in the attached map, map option L. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and we are very pleased to, uh, to get that issue resolved. Uh, now it's time for item 2B, an application by Charles and Patricia Stump, owners of the historic designation of the William Purcell residence located at 252 Ocotillo Drive, uh, and I will note uh, in pure coincidence that uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner and I had the pleasure of sitting at the uh, breakfast for the Indio Independent uh, President's Day Parade with uh, uh, Charles uh, on Monday this week and watching him drive off on his beautifully historic Thunderbird. So with that, uh, uh, I'd like to ask for the staff report. Good evening, Council, Madam Mayor. Uh, if you give me just a moment, I will start the presentation. Okay. So the matter before you this evening is a public hearing to consider designating the William Purcell residence uh, historic. Uh, the Purcell residence was designed by architect William Purcell and constructed in 1934. Mr. Purcell was a notable architect um, between 1900, 1920. Uh, his earliest, th this, this home that's before you this evening is the earliest example of residential modern architecture in the city of Palm Springs. Um, it's, and it's also his only known commission in the, in the valley here. So this is a picture when the home was built in 1934. And the matter was considered by the Historic Site Preservation Board on December 7th, and that they found that the home met three of the required criteria for designation for class one or class um, historic designation. So criteria on two um, being that um, Mr. Purcell was the person making meaningful contribution. Um, his history is relative to the American Prairie School of Architecture. Uh, and he did work with George Elms, Elmsley um, and together they are uh, have notable work um, of small town banks designed and constructed throughout the Midwest. 
Um, and so that is for criteria on number two. And then as it relates to criteria on number three, it exemplifies the period, uh, on a particular period in history. Notably here, this was between the wars, the World War I and World War II. Um, and as I said, it was one of the earliest residential structures in Palm Springs designed in a modernist style of architecture. It also represents a transition um, in architectural design um, and taste after World War I. So as I said, it was kind of the earlier parts of modern architecture in Palm Springs. And then lastly, criterion number five, uh, it is the work of a master architect. Um, William Purcell is, was instrumental in defining and developing um, what has become known as American Organic or Prairie School of Architecture. Um, and that was found more than, uh, found in more than 20 states throughout the nation. Um, so those were the criteria necessary to grant a designation when it comes to whether the board or the city designates the properties class one or class two. The council would also also have to find that the home is of good integrity, has a high degree of integrity. Uh, in this case, there have been additions um, to the exterior of the building uh, that have impaired the integrity. Um, so because of that, the board did recommend a class two designation. So, um, and you can see a little bit of that here when the picture on the left shows the building when it was built in 1934. Here on the right, you see the some of the horizontal elements of the architecture have been uh, covered with stucco. The garage door has been covered and has now, now has windows. Uh, so there's been a series of things that have happened to the structure uh, to uh, reduce some of the integrity required for the highest level, which is the class one designation. Um, so again, uh, staff has prepared a recommendation or a resolution for you, your consideration this evening to designate the property a class two structure. And um, this is a public hearing. And in the resolution, I would just note, we've identified what um, portions of the property do contribute and those that are not contributing to the class two designation. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Are there uh, questions for uh, staff? Uh, I don't see any. Uh, do we have any public uh, uh, any uh, public speakers? We have no pu we have no public comment on this item. All right. Uh, there being no uh, public uh, speakers, the public uh, hearing is now closed. Is there a uh, discussion or additional questions from staff? Uh, Council Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Um, I'd like to make a motion to um, approve staff's recommendation. This is a house I've actually driven by for almost 20, the last 20 years, almost every day. It's down the street from um, where I grew up. Yeah. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add that uh, uh, it was pure coincidence that we ended up sitting at the table with uh, Charles on Monday, but we got a chance to uh, here at a personal level, some of the history of his family and that home. And uh, it is really a pleasure uh, to be able to uh, move on this uh, uh, matter this evening. Uh, on behalf of everyone in the city council, our congratulations for uh, your role in uh, preserving the history of our city. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tim Garner. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstedge. Yes. Council Member Woods. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of items left uh, on the agenda that uh, uh, that may take a little bit of time, but one of those that uh, uh, we can move through relatively quickly is uh, item 5B, which is the fiscal year financial audit reports of the city of Palm Springs. And if there is no objection, uh, I'd like to uh, go ahead and 
do 5B, allow the auditors to give their report and give them their evening back. Uh, and then we will take a short break uh, before moving on uh, back to uh, item uh, uh, 4A and uh, uh, dealing with that issue. Yeah. And I see no objection. So uh, we will move forward with the staff report, please, on item 5B. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. Staff is recommending that you receive and file the financial audit reports for fiscal year end June 30th, 2021. Um, they, the audit was performed by the Poon Group. And tonight we have the partner, Ken Poon, and he'd like to give you a, a short presentation. Ken? Ken, can you hear us? Ken? Uh-oh. It's not looking like he hears us. <laughs> Ken, are you able to hear us? I don't think he's able to hear it, hear us at this time. I'm able to hear. Okay, good, good. We, I thought we lost you for a moment. No, Thank don't you. worry. So you could go ahead and give your presentation, please. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me Thank share screen real quick. And uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, member of the City Council here. Uh, my name is Ken Poon. I'm the managing partner of the Poon Group here and the auditor for the uh, City of Palm Spring here. We'd like to actually present to you tonight is the list of report, but mainly focusing on the ACFR, the Annual Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. So this is a standard presentation. Uh, this is for the year end, uh, June 30, 2021, which covers the last fiscal year that you have. So we, we complete our audit in December and uh, present to you tonight the audit results. So first off, it's actually talking about our responsibility in accordance with the professional standard. As you, as you can tell, you're engaging our firm to perform the audit. So we are here to express our opinion on the financial statement and making sure that these financial statements are presented in accordance, uh, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principle. Um, our responsibility is to plan the audit and perform the audit in accordance with, uh, with um, generally accepted auditing standard. And uh, according to the standard, we need to obtain reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance about whether the financial statement are free from material misstatement, whether due from fraud or errors. Our other approach, and also with the uh, professional auditing standard, we are required to consider internal control over financial reporting. And such a consideration is solely to determine our audit procedures and not to provide any assurance concerning such internal control. But if we do identify any material weaknesses or significant deficiency, you will definitely hear from us in, uh, in writing. So the audit results, um, we are, um, we are happy to uh, present to you that the uh, financial statement are fairly presented. So that's why we are issuing an unmodified opinion, which is the best opinion that we can give to the uh, give it to our audit auditee. Um, what uh, what an uh, unmodified opinion means is that the financial statement are fairly presented in all material respect. The significant accounting policy have been consistently applied. The estimates are reasonable, and the disclosure are properly reflected in these financial statement. However, we do actually have one uh, audit findings is relating to the internal control over financial reporting. And um, this is the uh, audit finding present to you. Uh, during the audit, we actually do make a couple of prior period adjustments to really to clean up some of the uh, misreporting in the internal service fund and kind of clean up some, some of the, uh, the, the reporting requirements. A uh, couple of the reasons why uh, since last year, uh, you do act actually have uh, experienced a significant redu reduction of staff uh, due to COVID-19. And also um, during this fiscal year, you are in the process of implementing a new ERP system. So uh, having said that, um, uh, it's not a surprise that there are some corrections that needs to be made, but everything uh, with, uh, with the new additional staff uh, within your finance team, uh, the internal control are being set up and reviewed new procedures. 
Uh, also, the uh, finance department also complete the implementation of the new ERP system. So therefore, the issues has been resolved. So that's conclude my presentation. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Are there any questions for Mr. Poon? There we go. Now I can see everyone. Mr. Poon, I'm not seeing any. So let me ask you just a couple of really basic questions that I know you'll be able to answer. Uh, sure. The uh, In the course of the audit, uh, were you able to access all records that you sought? Yes, we do. Okay. And uh, were you able to access all individuals that you wish to uh, speak with and interview? Yes. And was there any information that you sought that was denied to you? No, there isn't. Okay. And I, I knew that was going to be what the answers were, but I wanted to get them into the public record to, uh, to make sure that everyone knows that's how we go about doing our external audits. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear those answers. Great. Uh, there are no questions. Uh, uh, our comments from uh, City Council, this is a receive and file item, and we will uh, take uh, and receive it. Thank you, and Mr. Poon, thank you and your team for your work. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, it is uh, 7.48. Uh, let's take a break until... 8 a.m. Uh, or 8 p.m. sharp, uh, and uh, uh, we will then re reconvene. Thank you.
Uh, the next item is 4A, a discussion of the use of fireworks within the city of Palm Springs. I would like to ask for a staff report. Uh, and, and within the staff report, I would also like to specifically ask that staff explain why we are revisiting this issue since so many in the community did believe that uh, it had been resolved. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. I'm Jeannie Case. I am the Interim Parks and Recreation Director. My lighting's a little orange. Uh, I'm here tonight along with uh, Jasmine Waits to continue the discussion of the use of fireworks within the city of Palm Springs. At the September 9th meeting, council heard about noise concerns and explored options for quiet fireworks or alternatives to fireworks said that staff returned with more information focused on air quality impacts and recommendations for other events using fireworks. So tonight's staff report is a continuation of that September 9th discussion and specifically addresses council's request to investigate the air quality impact of fireworks. And Jasmine and I are happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there questions for staff? Uh, council, uh, council, okay, he's shaking his head. Are there any <laughs> questions for staff? All right, Mr. Council Member Cores, you can't make that many hand motions without uh, doing something. No, I was just resting my hand on my, my chin when you thought I was, I had questions. Anyone else? All right. Uh, are, if there are no questions from anyone, uh, is there uh, a discussion of uh, uh, this by council? Uh, council Member Woods. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, Jeannie, I'm sorry I didn't ask earlier. Can you talk a little about the, um, or Jasmine, the pollution impacts of um, fireworks and what your discovery showed? Sure, thank you. Um, I reached out to the South Coast Air Quality Management um, Group and, and spoke with actually um, Dr. Pacman. He is the, um, um, the supervisor, the program supervisor in advanced monitoring technologies at South Coast AQMD. So he provided me with some detailed information about some of the studies that they've done at AQMD. And, um, and those reports are in your staff report. He talked about um, emissions and uh, fireworks are equivalent to automobile emissions. They actually produce the same particulate matter and um, very similar, um, it's, it's very similar to an auto emission. And so, um, so he explained all of this to me. He, he talked to me of, and, sent me an article, which I um, included in your packet as well. Um, his explanation was that there, there aren't really good studies about local community fireworks. There are these larger studies, and that's what um, this the article that's attached to your staff report says. There are these large studies about India and China, and, um, and even um, the AQMD studied the South Coast Basin, which is really the LA Inland Empire region, but it doesn't include Palm Springs. And so um, he gave a recommendation that um, there, there's a website called Purple Air and it's community scientific, um, like community scientists. You, you, you can purchase these air quality monitors um, and put it up at your home and, and do live air quality monitoring. And he recommended that maybe um, that's something that we could look into. I think that's a great idea. Um, just in general, fireworks or no fireworks, I think the um, these air quality monitors would be a great thing for us to explore in the city. Um, and so I hope that answered your question. I, fireworks are similar to the emissions that are put out by automobiles, just in the air. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, council member course. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I've done a lot of research. Um, I think I've shared some 
when we first discussed this, um, I've shared with staff uh, impacts of fireworks and not just air quality. And I appreciate the additional information um, that you got. So thank you for that. But also the heavy metals that end up in food and water, that wildlife and pests ingest. Um, information on a number of pets who escape and run away during fireworks due to their sensitive hearing, which we heard testimony about. Impacts on people, including those with PTSD, which we've heard about. You know, personally for me, most of my life, fireworks are one of my favorite things, right? I always look forward to them. But as I learn more about the harms and the impacts on the environment, people and pets, I've concluded that there are better ways to celebrate holidays and other occasions that don't have all these negative impacts. You know, as a city, we pride ourselves on being a leader on protecting the environment, public health, and the welfare of animals, both domestic and wildlife. Um, I appreciate council has already voted to allow fireworks for uh, two occasions, July 4th and Veterans Day, um, but I don't think we should expand that. Um, I do support uh, the staff suggestion of a one-year pilot program with air quality monitors. And based on that report, it looks like we should try and keep fireworks as far away from residential neighborhoods as we can, that the explosions occur as high up as possible. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that they re recommend that we send notices in advance of fireworks, including the, the Air Quality Management District uh, recommendation to alert people to keep their doors and windows closed for a per speci specified period of time um, after the fireworks show to protect human life, um, which surely makes me question um, using fireworks. But that said, I think we should do those things. Now, I've heard from lots of people who also love fireworks and want to have them. Uh, you know, and I heard from um, Power Baseball, uh, but I've also heard from, you know, folks, uh, on, you know, primarily in District 3 uh, about the fireworks uh, over um, Veterans Day Parade and the impacts that had. So to the extent we can make sure we're notifying folks, you know, I heard from folks as far away as Asina from the high school when they had their graduation fireworks and the traumatized pets, um, you know, including medical conditions that pets suffered. Uh, so, you know, I think I unfortunately was the one council meeting I missed was when this was discussed, but I understand uh, at least a lot of people thought it was gonna be for the two, you know, patriotic occasions and not others. And so uh, I would hope that we continue uh, with, with that. And uh, I think why we're here is it was unclear whether that was voted on or um, it was just those two that were voted on and the rest were deferred. So just for the public, um, from my reviewing that meeting, that's that's the reason it's back. Are there other council members who wanna weigh in? Well, let me uh, jump in. Uh, this has been a topic of lots of conversation in our city. Uh, and uh, the, uh, one of the issues that we have had when it comes to fireworks is uh, uh, in our city because of where they tend to be shot out at and where our residents are. Uh, the fireworks in, uh, in Palm Springs are uh, very, very close to residences and homes and uh, uh, which heightens the impact. So uh, I believe that uh, we have done well in identifying uh, two uh, incredibly important uh, patriotic holidays that have a long history and association with fireworks, Veterans Day uh, and the 4th of July. Uh, and uh, those are longstanding celebrations in our community and we take a lot, awful lot of pride in Palm Springs with both uh, days and the events associated. Uh, so I wanna preserve those, but uh, I am as well, uh, would like to stay with just those two days for fireworks. And I agree with council member Coors, we should do everything that we can uh, to make uh, clear in our community uh, the two days we're going to have them and the time of day that we're going to have them so that those who are particularly sensitive, uh, be it uh, an individual uh, person or one of our, uh, our pets who are truly members of our family, 
uh, that uh, we can take the precautions appropriate. Any other comments? Is there a motion? Council member Kors. So I make a motion that uh, we don't give any additional um, permits besides the two city um, events that were already approved, that we uh, do move forward with uh, the pilot monitoring. Um, I think uh, not just for fireworks, but in general, um, I think that's a good thing for the city and that we provide notice uh, to residents with enough uh, advance notice to residents about when fireworks uh, are happening uh, so they can prepare if they do have uh, pets or other, other issues. And I will second that motion. Any other comments and discussion? Uh, Council Member Woods. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm wondering if there isn't a compromise um, to this. And um, and uh, 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 Jasmine and, and Jeannie, maybe you can, can address it. Um, you know, we have these fireworks, I guess, that, you know, don't make noise. You know, they, they give the, 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 the spectacular light show, but they don't make noise. Can you talk to that with a little bit? Maybe Jasmine can speak to that. I can. So in my previous presentation, I did show a short video of what they consider um, quiet fireworks. They're not necessarily quiet. They're just quieter than original fireworks. So some of the larger cylinders that the city uses um, for, for our fireworks show provide a, a um, a louder backfire sound, which is the sound that is causing concern for our residents. And what the quiet fireworks show it uses is just the smaller cylinder. So there still is a sound. It's just not as loud as the larger ones are. Council member Kors. Sure. So is there a downside to those other than um, the quiet earnest for those who like the loud bang. Um. The the only issue is is they don't um, fly as high in the sky, so they would be better utilized for uh, smaller events. Say maybe something that was taking place on the O'Donnell Golf Course, where um, Evening Under the Stars uses uh, fireworks. Typically, they have not requested it for this year, but um, it 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 can be seen. On a, on a flat service. It would not be great for our 4th of July fireworks show where the um, radius of people watching the, the fireworks show is much further out. So it's good for a very small kind of intimate setting. Thank you. Uh, Council member uh, Woods. Um, and it seems to me like in looking at the one, two, three, four, five uh, potentials that we've had in the past, including the homecoming parade and the white party, those are all smaller events that would go that quiet might work because um, they're for smaller events that are usually in a smaller geographic location. Would that be correct? The only one that stands out to me that, well, actually both the, the probably the high school would be a little bit challenging based on where they shoot their fireworks off from. And um, power baseball would be a little bit challenging because they also shoot it from the same location that we do for July 4th. So it is a smaller group of people that attend their, their opening at the power baseball uh, game, but it, it still is behind a fence uh, that would be a lot of their fireworks wouldn't reach over the fence for viewing pleasure from the stadium. Are there other comments? Uh, uh, Council member Holstich. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jeannie, for the amazing research that you did. It really takes a librarian um, to get amazing research like this or this issue. 
Sorry, I have a child in the background. Um, I just was wondering in terms of if there's been any outreach or conversation with the school district about the Palm Springs homecoming parade and um, if we've heard uh, or talked to them at all about their plans to continue that um, for the students or not. There hasn't been any, any outreach to um, the high school in terms of uh, their fireworks show. They tend to do something probably every other year. Well, the last year they utilized the fireworks show for their graduation uh, because they held it outdoors, which was a unique situation. Normally it's indoors at the convention center, but in order to um, be COVID safe, they did it outdoors and the fireworks show was just a bonus. And um, some years they'll do it for their homecoming parade or their homecoming uh, game. And some years they won't do it. So there hasn't been any outreach, but I'm more than happy to do so to find out if they have uh, a, a consistent schedule that they would like to implement. Thanks. That's helpful. And where do they shoot those fireworks off from? So um, it is a field that is just uh, south of their football field. It, there's kind of a like a dip area. They shoot them off from from that dip area uh, so that it so that everyone at the football game can can view. Thanks. That's helpful. Any other comments or questions? And uh, I think it's a roll call, please. Certainly, and I'll just clarify the motion is to implement a pilot air monitoring program. Uh, there will be no permits except for the 4th of July in Veterans Day events, and there'll be notification uh, regarding the date and time of the fireworks. Uh, with that, Council Member Kors. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Hi. Council Member Holstich. No. Council Member Woods. No. Mayor Pro Tim Middleton. Oh, I think that's me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mayor Pro Tim Gardner. <laughs> I apologize. I was a little confused for a second. Um, no. Motion fails three to two. Uh, is there a substitute motion or is there a uh, another motion that uh, uh, a member of council would like to make? Council member Woods. Um, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I will agree with council member Coors and the mayor um, about the monitoring. I think that's a good thing for us. I'm, um, I'd like to propose at least we can try it for a year or, or reach out to some of the people um, to try some of the quieter fireworks for these smaller events versus the big city events. We'll see if there's a second for that. Is there a limit on the number of uh, these smaller events that you are proposing, uh, Council Member Woods? Um, I wasn't because, you know, it's very expensive to host fireworks. So it has to be some of the events that we've had in the past. Um, so I wasn't at this point unless, um, it, you know, if, if in the future, if we find out it doesn't work, we can come back and revisit it. Uh, council member, of course. Just a clarification, because I know they weren't on the list. Um, and I don't know if that was due to COVID, but I've been to weddings where people have had fireworks. Um, I don't know whether or without permits, but actually professional fireworks. So. Um, just wanted to raise that. Uh, so I don't know if this is unlimited, if this is just certain small events, you know, just some clarification, or is it just unlimited that your motion is? Um, at this point, it was unlimited, but I don't know if we have a second for it. <laughs> um, so we'll see where that goes. Right. Uh, Can I ask? I'm sorry, can I ask a clarifying question, Mayor? Yes, please. Or if I could just ask Jasmine a question um, to follow up on that. So um, can you respond about the permit requests that we get for the fireworks for private events like weddings? Um, is that included in the five to eight permits a year, fireworks permits a year that the city typically sees? Uh, it is. So the list that you have in your staff report um, was identified based on the last three years. 
of permits that came through. And this is from the fire department. So uh, yes, it is inclusive of uh, any smaller private events. Uh, we do get those requests and uh, they do go through the same process. We just haven't received them in a couple of years. But, it, but on average, it's anywhere between five to eight uh, fireworks show in the city uh, throughout the year. And could you explain for the public, especially the special event um, permit planning process and what that looks like? And then as we think about like incentives to have fireworks or um, quiet fireworks that sound like they're similarly polluting, right? The quiet fireworks are similarly polluting. They're just less noisy. Is that right? That's correct. Thank you. Um, so could you just detail that process? And then, so the cost of the application, if you have fireworks versus if you have like an environmentally friendly alternative, would that cost be the same to the applicant? So currently, yes, the, the cost would be equal uh, for someone who uh, wanted to do a larger firework show or a smaller firework show. Uh, the process would be to submit a special event application uh, to uh, to myself. I take all the documentation and I send it out to the special events planning team, which is comprised of uh, members from across our whole city, including our uh, some of our outside agencies, uh, the health department, um, the Department of Alcohol and Beverage Control, Sunline Transit, and uh, that application is reviewed uh, cohesively of all the components of a special event. And each member of our team responds uh, to the applicant of what would be required in order to fulfill their event uh, successfully and safely. Uh, when it comes to fireworks, there's an additional fee that is included through our Palm Springs Fire Department, and that fee is $597, and that is specific for the permit for fireworks. Uh, we do require just naturally from any special event, and including firework show, that their notification has to be provided to neighbors who could be impacted by a special event. It could be parking, it could be sound, um, and if there are fireworks, obviously we make sure that's an additional uh, notice that is put on the notification out to neighbors, and we try to use different avenues of getting that notification out to neighbors so that you know, if you do happen to miss it in the paper, maybe you caught it on the news or you caught it on some sort of social media component. Um, but we do try and make sure that that notification gets blanketed to neighbors uh, regarding any special event that could impact them. Uh, I I think we could possibly have a conversation about providing some sort of incentive, maybe uh, a discounted rate if someone wanted to provide uh, a smaller fireworks show. Uh, I would want to identify what would be considered smaller and I'd be happy to provide council with some more detail on um, the, the smaller cylinders and what that size fireworks show. We would need to put some sort of limit of maybe it's the three cylinder fireworks and uh, you know uh, for Veterans Day and, and July 4th, we could use the six cylinder fireworks. Um, there could be I would be in favor of trying to provide some sort of incentive uh, to encourage promoters to utilize uh, a smaller fireworks show, which would be less impactful to residents and uh, their animals. Thanks. That's really helpful. I think there might be a number of policy um, opportunities for the council like that. So an incentive for options that don't pollute the environment. I mean, if we want to talk about polluting the environment, we can probably talk about special events using plastic and styrofoam and non-reusables as probably one of the most impactful, you know, travel time, um, cars to get to events. I mean, you know, if we really added up like the environmental impact of events, this might not be the most impactful. That doesn't mean it's not something we might want to mitigate for our community as well as the noise and things like that. So I like that suggestion. I mean, Dennis's motion is different. So I just, but I just wanted to um, think that through with you, right. About, you know, we could, I know we are limited on fees, but um, that's quite a low fee for some of these very, very large events that are over a hundred thousand dollar, you know, to produce. Um, you know, I wonder if we can consider like mitigation impact fees um, for the environmental impact or something like that as well, um, or your idea of an incentive. 
Um, or we could put limits, you know, on what type of events are where, like spheres, right? If it's in neighborhoods um, or something like that. So I just wanted to think that through. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, Dennis had a motion. I just want to clarify my position before that happened. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. No, oh. sorry, I didn't have anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, based on the recommendations from Jasmine, are, is there a uh, modific uh, modification to the uh, motion from Mr. Uh, from Council Member Woods? Okay, so, I, uh, okay, go ahead, please. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? Jeannie, if we were to put, will the devices for tracking the pollution that you identified, would those pick up pollution from fireworks? Like if we put them around events, would be able to actually collect data around them? Yes, and in fact, um, there are, um, monitoring stations already in the city of Palm Springs at residence um, homes. So in your staff report, the last page has um, has the, the green dots with the numbers and that's the air, the current air quality at the time I printed that screen. So you could go to this website right now and, and check out the air quality in these areas. And I, it's, I, I love data. So this is fascinating to me to, to see the numbers, but it's, it is something that can be monitored uh, real time, it could be placed in uh, in different areas throughout the city, strategically placed near where fireworks would be going off. But yes, it it monitors um, all kind the 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 PM two point five, which is the particulate matter that is um, automobile emissions and um, fireworks emissions. So it it monitors different types of particulate matter. Thank you. Uh, Question, uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. So I, I think that um, this has been a, a frustrating uh, discussion over the course of our, our meetings. Um, but one thing that I think there is, is, there has been some interest, I think, for us to move into a different direction than fireworks. Um, but I think that, I, I mean, I'm interested in providing incentives, like Council Member Holstage said about doing other types of events. I'm also not opposed to maybe phasing them out over time um, or some other compromise, but I do wanna just point out that um, we are coming out of a time when people weren't able to do a lot of things. And there's just, for instance, the power game, they were really excited about getting to do baseball again last year and getting to put on the show and they didn't get an opportunity. So I guess I'm, I'm really just feeling for these organizations that have been doing this for just decades and decades who didn't kind of get a, a last chance to do this because it was so abrupt um, and they didn't really get that, um, I don't know, that warning. Um, these are these are big institutional changes. And I know that it seems probably to some people like something small, but I think for a lot of residents, it's really important. But I don't also I also don't want to discount the light show, you know, that we had. I have a cousin um, who absolutely loved it and said it was better than any fireworks show he's ever been to. And he couldn't stop raving about it, you know, and and this is someone this is a kid who who did have problems with fireworks in the past. So I'm, I don't want to discount what anyone has been raising or what they've been um, or the impacts that it has to people with different needs um, and our pets. But I am interested in giving um, some kind of a phase out <laughs> if we're going to go in that direction. Um, and I do know that part of the reason that we came to this initial compromise, which yes, to the public, I think the majority of council thought we had resolved this. So this was a surprise when it had to come back. Um, but part of the reason that we came to that compromise, I think, was because Mayor Middleton had talked to many veterans and we had received lots of calls from veterans saying that the 4th of July fireworks were really important to them. And of course, we did receive some veterans who said, you know, no, don't do it. Um, but it's just it is a divisive issue. There are people really 50 50 on whether or not this is something that should move forward. Um, so I'm not sure if that's something that council would be interested in and kind of. Um, 
doing what staff recommended here and putting up these um, um, monitors and letting some of these events take place one last time and then phasing them out. I'm not sure if that's something that people are interested in. If I could ask uh, the uh, Council Member Woods a clarification question. Uh, under the proposal that you're making, uh, the uh, uh, events other than the Veterans Day and 4th of July would need to be the quiet uh, or quieter uh, fireworks, is that correct? That's what I'm proposing because I think that from the complaints that we've heard um, mm -hmm. about um, post-traumatic stress and animals and things of that nature, that it might resolve that issue um, mm -hmm. to a degree and allow some of these events to still have the you know, kind of the spectacular that kind of defines Palm Springs. It doesn't seem like the pollution is as big of an issue as we thought. And with the smaller ones, it might be less. Um, so that was that was the general thinking, but I'm open to the whole council discussion. Mm -hmm. I am not, you know, I'm not predetermined on anything here. So um, I can either withdraw it and somebody else can do it or we can amend it. Either way, I'm, I'm cool. All right, and uh, my other clarification question, uh, are you proposing that uh, for uh, these events other than 4th of July and uh, Veterans Day, that they be ones that staff would uh, have authority to uh, approve or would any of these come back to city council on an individual basis for approval? I, I would leave that to staff. Um, I think the, the research that staff has done so far, um, I would leave it to staff. I don't think that we wanna burden our council calendar more and kind of give favoritism to one group over another for whatever reason. Um, I do hear council member core's concern about um, small weddings and whatnot. And um, if we, if there's a way to limit it, if somebody wants to kind of second it and make a, a friendly amendment, I'm open to it. Uh, council member course. I have a question. Um, so count, council member, I'm Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Um, uh, so what were you suggesting, just so I understand it is, we allow the events that have sort of been the standard events for the next year, and then phase out things other than July 4th and Veterans Day thereafter? Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm grappling with. Um, I, I, I think this is gonna be an issue that comes up again and again and again, if um, potentially, or it could be with each new council. So I'm not really sure if this is something that's ever gonna resolve completely, but that would, it's just an option. Uh, Council Member Halstitch. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think um, I've been waiting to comment just to hear everyone's side and, and opinion and, and get all the facts. Um, you know, it's hard. I think that we've heard from our community, a significant portion of our community want to phase out and have no more fireworks because of the impact on them and their pets and the environment. Um, and so, you know, I don't think, you know, taking this vote, probably fireworks are not going to be around for a long time, you know, in 10, 15 years. I, I just can't imagine that really it's the way of the future. Um, but it is like, you know, it's, it's a harken back to the past and the 4th of July and our country's founding all the war and all these things. Right. And so, um, I, you know, I, I'm just in this place where I, I support Council Member Woods' proposal. Um, I was hesitant, you know, I'm happy to second it. It sounds like there's some third vote out there that needs to be decided. Um, and so I don't know if that would be Mayor Pro Tem Garner, what your friendly amendment would be to that motion um, to approve it. Um, it sounded like you said, you know, an ultimate phasing out. Um, I'm open to that, um, but I don't think we have heard from all stakeholders. I totally agree with your comments about COVID. It'd be sad to take away, you know, seniors have gone through so much, high school seniors, um, you know, and if they've looked forward to that homecoming game and the fireworks for years and then they don't have it, and that's just something that we chose to take away in addition to everything they've lost, 
you know, that doesn't sit right with me. Same with Palm Springs Power, other opportunities for the community to come together. So um, that's why I had a hard time, especially with this vote in these times. Um, but so I, I'm open to the proposal that Council Member Woods put out. Um, you know, I don't think it gets us fully to the environmental impacts. And that was why I was exploring like incentives or, or um, mitigation or things like that. Um, but I, I support the motion as it is. And um, I would also support, you know, amendments to that if if we wanted to analyze it. I'm really excited about actually the opportunity to track the data um, and really analyze it and, and have the opportunity to say, wow, you know, this is polluting our city this much or our air. Um, and the, all that, and, and to know that impact, I think would be really interesting for us to have more data to go on. Can we just get the motion repeated one more time? Certainly. Uh, what I have is to implement the monitoring program and then one year of quieter fireworks for the other events, uh, not including uh, Veterans Day and 4th of July, uh, with no limit, uh, subject to staff approval of the permit. And then uh, 4th of July and Veterans Day would be uh, subject to the full fireworks show. Okay, thank you. And and as far as we know, we don't even know necessarily if all of these events will move well i think we we've heard from power baseball it sounds like they will would move forward if they could but we don't know about the others other than white party that has an application in right now that's correct those two agencies have um reached out to us uh and requested to do fireworks in the the spring okay okay thank you very much uh is there further discussion so just set the record, uh, I will be voting uh, no uh, on uh, this. Uh, I appreciate the direction that uh, uh, is being proposed with additional monitoring limiting uh, to one year, uh, but uh, the, uh, these, are, these are only quieter fireworks. And the impacts, uh, particularly on pets, is real. Uh, it's dramatic. Uh, and uh, uh, in other communities where fireworks are shot off uh, much farther away from residences, uh, that uh, it, uh, it has significantly less impact. But uh, I appreciate where my colleagues are coming from. And sometimes we just have differences of opinion over uh, issues and we've talked we've talked this one through. Uh, so uh, council member course. I'll, I'll echo those as well. I appreciate the conversation, but I do have a question um, since this would allow more than the events that regularly happen uh, if people wanted to do that. Um, so what are, what are the rules on people doing them at a wedding, you know, in, a, in an, and around a residential neighborhood where even quieter is gonna be very loud? So depending on the size of the firework, um, depends on the fallout zone, which um, obviously higher fireworks have a larger radius of a fallout zone. So you can't have any uh, buildings near in, uh, homes, uh, commercial buildings near or within within the fallout zone. So there are restrictions in terms of what size firework would be allotted in a residential area. So the golf course has um, not as large of fireworks because it is closer to some residential and uh, some hotels. Uh, However, the area that we utilize for July 4th is set back. So the fallout zone falls um, closer to the high school's uh, baseball fields. So it's an open area and, and the pavilion parking lot. So the fallout zone um, is in that area. So it's not near any buildings. So there are some restrictions in terms of the allowance of really large fireworks in any sort of residential or commercial area where there are buildings. By golf course, did you mean O'Donnell? Correct. 
So, so we our, utilize O'Donnell for both Veterans Day and uh, Evening Under the Stars utilizes fireworks at the O'Donnell Golf Course. And because of the small out zone, are those considered the, the quieter fireworks? They're the smaller ones, yes. And it also is in proximity to where they're set off. So, um, you know, if they are set off, say, closer to the Hyatt, um, those would be smaller. The Veterans Day fireworks take place right in the center of O'Donnell Golf Course, so it has a larger fallout zone. Evening Under the Stars takes place closer to, say, the clubhouse, um, and they are smaller fireworks in comparison to Veterans Day. Okay, just because one of the comments was on, on the noise was tied to Veterans Day, someone who said sort of um, Alejo, you know, uh, between Indian and El, and El Segundo. So those were those were not smaller. Those were larger for Veterans Day at the golf course. Correct? Definitely not as large as July 4th. Um, I do believe the largest one we have for Veterans Day is a four inch. Okay. And um, for July 4th, I'm close. I'm pretty sure we have about a seven. So um, not as large as July 4th, but larger than evening under the stars. Okay, just so folks understand um, the noise factor of the smaller ones. Thank you. Uh, if there is no further discussion, uh, roll call place. I'm sorry, I, I don't have a second for the motion. Uh, I, <laughs> is there a second for the motion? <laughs> My apology. I'll second. All right. Roll call, please. Councilmember Woods. Yes. Councilmember Holstech. Yes. Councilmember Kors. No. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. No. Motion passes three to two. All right, thank you. Thanks, my colleagues, and uh, uh, and I appreciate uh, the, the manner in which we carried on this discussion this evening. And I'm sure that this issue will be back. But uh, thank you all, and most particularly uh, Janie Jasmine. Thank you for your work. Thank you. All right. With that, we will move on to item 5A, which is the Community Development Block Grant, uh, CDBG 2022-23 Annual Action Plan and Budget Discussion. Uh, staff report, please, Mr. Verrata. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and council members. Uh, it's that time again where uh, we are required to start discussing the annual action plan and budget for next year's CDBG appropriation. Uh, this is a requirement by the Housing and Urban Development Department, HUD, uh, and uh, which requires us to prepare this annual action plan for HUD review before commencing with next year's program activities. And uh, so tonight we'd like to discuss uh, potential projects for next year's CDBG funds. And we're estimating that amount will be $430,000 uh, as the allocation for the city. This is subject to change. Uh, this is based on the amount we received last year, which was actually 431,000. So uh, again, subject to change depending on the allocation from CDBG, from HUD. And uh, as we've seen over the past couple of years, HUD has been making a lot of changes to their allocations, particularly with the CDBG uh, COVID funding that they provided the city. However, uh, we do not anticipate that type of COVID funding uh, being provided uh, for next year. So um, with that, uh, you know, we do have a 20% statutory allocation for administrative costs. And 20% of 430,000 is approximately $86,000. Uh, we also have a 15% uh, 
public service allocation, uh, which would result in about $64,500. And the balance is typically used for uh, public facilities and capital improvements, which we anticipate to be in the amount of $279,500, again, uh, totaling $430,000. You may recall that uh, a, a couple of years ago, the council voted to use what's referred to as model three, which enables the city council to select projects uh, from uh, uh, to be implemented from city sponsored events, as opposed to uh, soliciting projects from uh, from the general public. So we've been proceeding with this, and as you can see, uh, previous allocations have gone towards Demuth Park for. Uh, air conditioning systems and restrooms and to Sunrise Park also for uh, improvements there. Uh, and so in line with uh, those types of improvements for next year, we're seeing opportunities in, in coordination with the city's uh, engineering department uh, for shade shelters over the parks in Baristo Park and at uh, Duluth Park. These are parks within low moderate income areas. Uh, of course, the council may want to deliberate a little bit and decide if there are other programs that might be eligible for the CDBG fund expenditures. We do hope to be able to come back to you with the draft annual action plan at the next council meeting on uh, March 10th to provide you with um, uh, what the plan would look like and initiate having that plan uh, reviewed during a 30-day public review process. Afterwards, uh, at the April 21st meeting, we would like to uh, adopt that plan, of course, taking into consideration all the comments that come in in regards to the plan. And soon after that, submit that to HUD for their review and program implementation uh, well, I want to say soon after that, uh, but uh, you know, it's um, sometimes it takes a while to get the uh, funding letters submitted uh, from the federal government to us directly. And so that uh, is basically the overview of what's being requested tonight. Uh, so your consideration for uh, the the uh, shade project uh, is is being requested. Also listed is the possibility of using the funds for the navigation center. However, given that the navigation center uh, still has to go through so many phases of design, uh, I, I think the opportunities for allocation to a navigation center, if we do ultimately, might be better for next year's uh, annual action plan consideration. So uh, with that, please, uh, any questions you have, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jay. Um, I'm wondering when we're going to get the new census map. Do you know when that will will get to us and when we'll start designating money based on a new map? I have been checking that website, uh, preparing this staff report, and uh, they still have the older uh, data on, on the federal website. So I just want to make sure I get the correct map uh, from HUD, but we do not have that yet. Um, but that would be very useful information. Keeping in mind, however, if the funds are used to serve 70% uh, of the clientele being low moderate income, uh, it does not have to be limited to being within a low moderate income area. In fact, the uh, navigation center is across the street from a low income moderate area, low moderate income area. And so uh, given that the clientele there will very likely be uh, more than 70% low moderate income, it would be an eligible use of funds there. Okay, thank you. The reason I bring it up is because we've had, you know, some areas where we haven't been able to do some improvements because of the way that the the map is, 
And so I'm, I'm just anxious to kind of get that new data to see if our outreach efforts worked and we have a better sense. Because we do know that there are some areas in our um, city that are low to moderate income, which we know from other um, data tracking, but there's first for whatever reason not in the listed as CDBG um, appropriate. So I, I just wanted to flag that because I know, for instance, um, the James O'Jesse mural that's on the side of the gym needs improvement, um, but that's technically not an eligible area um, under our, our current map. So that's just one of those things that I wanted to point out for the public. Um, but then also wanted to point out what um, was said before about how difficult the CDBG money is to actually dole out and process. And so um, I'm, I'm supportive of kind of funding these city projects since the city can better um, process this and then be able to allocate in our budgeting process other projects um, so that we don't put that burden of um, accepting CDBG funds on on providers who who really don't need that extra um, work. So I, I'm I'm just supportive of this general direction. Uh, Council Member Holstich, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with Mayor Pro Tem's comments. I like the direction of um, having these be uh, city projects, especially because so many are needed and there's so much work to do and really appreciate um, the council's decision um, on, on what we've achieved so far in the last year with the bathroom projects and um, the investments we've made. So um, that's really exciting. So uh, Jay, so your recommendation is not to fund the Navigation Center at this time with this round of funds. And then do you have an alternative to fund? I'm sorry if I missed that. Well, uh Council member, the Navigation Center uh, right now, the funding for the Navigation Center, it, the majority of which for the capital improvements is the, is the application we have in to the state for Home Key 2 funds that would potentially pay for all the uh, improvements needed to get the Navigation Center in shape for operations. And for the operations, uh, we had allocated the remaining HHAP funds, the uh, HAP $10 million to help operate the facility after it's completed. And of course, uh, as we had discussed a couple of meetings ago, uh, the County of Riverside uh, had covered the cost of the acquisition of the property. Sorry, so what's the alternative then? The alternative, the primary funding source is the home key two funds for the navigation center. Sorry, so if we're taking out the navigation center, what are we substituting in? I said, Mr. Clifton, oh, like to answer. Thank you. Sorry, it's so late. We've been meeting for such a long time. I'm extremely, right. you know, I'm still it, recovering. We, so sorry. No, I, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. The entire amount would be allocated for the shade structures. Oh, okay. That was a basic fact I probably missed in your presentation. Um, okay, thank you. I support that. Um, I'm really excited to see the investments we're making in playgrounds and our parks and our community centers and what a great way to spend this money. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. One thing I just wanted to raise since we're talking about shade um, is the possibility of using some of these funds to also um, fill in our bus shelters that don't have shade. I know I've been talking to Mayor Middleton about this for a while. Um, and we we have a, a map that shows where the different areas, which bus stops don't have shade. And there are some gaps, like more significant gaps. And I know that there are some bus stops that are actually have trees over them, so they wouldn't need it. it um, but but that's something that if I know this is going to come back to us again, I'm just curious kind of what that cost would be 
for us to, to put up shade structures, especially in some of those long strips. Um, for instance, Vista Chino has, I think, two or three that there's just nothing there and it's completely exposed. And go ahead. Uh, let me just jump in. Uh, yes, Mayor Pro Tem Garner and I have had some conversations on that. And I'm hopeful that uh, as we move into the budget for uh, fiscal year 2022-23, that we have an opportunity to take a look at uh, uh, some strategic uh, installations of uh, uh, shelters over uh, our bus stops. Uh, and thank you, Councilmember Woods, for letting me jump in. Yeah, certainly, it's the same thing. Um, I have asked for um, our bus stops to be evaluated in the update to the general plan. Um, because we have a hodgepodge of bus stops out there. And sometimes, as um, the mayor knows, well, uh, Sunline will change where bus stops are. And we need, you know, and if we have permanent ones that are on um, cement stilts, we can't just unbolt it and move it. And the new bus stops that Sunline has actually um, specified have all of the elements that you need for a good bus stop. Um, and um, I know when developers come in and they have a bus stop next to it and, and there's enough um, um, enough building going on that they can put a bus stop in, that happens. But I, I applaud it. Um, and I think we absolutely need to look at our bus stops holistically in the city to make mass transit more usable for everybody. Uh, Council member Holstrich. Can you just explain for me, since I'm this is new to me, so I thought that Sunline maintained the bus stops and is responsible for the lines, obviously, about where which bus stops are used and how frequently. Um, I know that when we approve development projects, right, then we may approve a bus stop to be, you know, built along with it and things like that. But so could you could sort of explain for me, I'm not opposed to improving the bus stops that are so needed. Um, I remember the one that used to go to Roy's and it was like 50 people standing out in the sun. It was horrible to see um, and for people to experience. Um, but can you just explain the law and sort of the jurisdiction and, and how the improvements of the bus stops work? Or if we're not discussing that today, can we get some information about that for next time when we do discuss it? Uh, maybe uh, since I'm a re representative to uh, Sunline, I could help uh, on that. Uh, Sunline uh, uh, is responsible for the bus stops. Uh, there's not a requirement that all bus stops uh, be uh, covered. And throughout the Coachella Valley, there are numerous number of bus stops that are not covered. There are also a number that are. Uh, Sunline has a priority list of uh, bus stops that as they are uh, able to have the funding, uh, that uh, they want to install covers on. And those priority lists are uh, developed based on uh, the ridership and the number of people uh, that are e at each uh, stop. It is also possible for individual municipalities who want to jumpstart the process uh, to make uh, an investment in uh, covering the bus stops. And we've done that historically in Palm Springs. Most of our bus stops are ones that Sunline did the covering, but some are ones that we have done it uh, here in Palm Springs. And uh, in fairness to everyone across the valley, uh, if someone, uh, if a city wants to jump the line, uh, it's, it's appropriate that that city be the responsible party for uh, paying for that jumping. Thanks. That's really helpful. I appreciate all your work on Sunline. You learn something every day, I'm even after five years. Um, I don't get to be involved in Sunline's operations. So thank you. Um, I think that's really important. And to Council Member Woods's point, you know, as we think about climate resiliency and we talked about heat islands and really how to how, you know, tree coverage, how we have so many palms that really don't provide real shade for our um, you know, 
bus stops or um, sidewalks or things like that. I think that's why the, obviously the shade structures of the playground are so important um, and would love to have us think more holistically. Yeah. About how we can make these types of investments. Can I just ask a question before I turn the floor over for the shade structures through the playgrounds? Um, do you know yet, or it would probably come back, I'm sure um, when we order the work, but I've seen that we've added some that are sort of like small little flags, um, triangular, triangular flags, which are beautiful. And then I've seen other cities have um, really, really large shade structures that provide more shade and are less beautiful. And I was just wondering if we could look at that sort of like the usability of um, really providing shade. Because what we hear from parents and families is that um, it's just, it's so hot to use our playgrounds the majority of the year. Um, and the, mo the most useful element here really is the amount of shade provided. Um, I think that would be helpful to look at. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, so do we have a motion? To so the motion is to move, move, move the item forward um, with shade structure structures being uh, the preference, correct? Yeah. Thank you. with that. All right. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and second. Uh, any other discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Council member Kors. Yes. Council member Woods. Yes. Council member Holstedge. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. Uh, we have previously uh, addressed item 5B. That will take us to item 5C. Appeal of the Historic Site Preservation Board action approving a certificate of appropriateness for alterations to the Palm Springs City Hall, a class one landmark historic site located at 3200 East Tokwitz Canyon Way, removal of the Frank Bogart statue. Uh, can we have a staff report, please? Madam Mayor and members of council, the item that you have before you this evening is an appeal of the Historic Site Preservation Board decision to issue a certificate of appropriateness for the removal of the Bogart statue from the City Hall site. Let me go ahead and start PowerPoint presentation. So as we talk about the Peel, I want to just give a little bit of background on the process for a certificate of appropriateness and why that is required for the Bogart statue. Pursuant to the municipal code and specifically chapter 8.05, which deals with historic preservation, it dictates that any alterations or demolition of a class one or class two historic resource must have a certificate of appropriateness approved by the Historic Site Preservation Board. In terms of the city hall site, it is a class one historic site. City Hall was originally designated back in 1996, as has been uh, mentioned in public testimony this evening, that designation was further clarified or expanded in 2012 to include the City Hall site. And so not only is it just the City Hall building, but the site is designated as a class one historic resource. I want to make that clear, staff is not saying that the Bogart statue is not part of the city hall site. It definitely is part of the site. However, in terms of talking about a class one historic resource, uh, we did ask ARG, the city's historic resource consultant, one of several that we have on call, to do an assessment of the site relative to defining contributing elements as well as character defining features. That is something that was not specifically studied or done as part of the 1996 or 2012 designations. Uh, as part of that, the Bogart statue was determined by ARG not to be a contributing element as it's not part of the original construction, nor was it part of the period of significance, which was 1957 to 1965. Now that is not to say that it is not an important element of the site. 
Uh, just to give you an example, the 1985 edition of the Development Services Wing is also defined by our consultant as not being a contributing element because it's outside the period of significance. That being said, regardless of uh, whether or not it's a contributing element, the code does require where a site has been designated that we must make a finding relative to a certificate of appropriateness, uh, any impacts to the historic resource. And so for that reason, that's what staff did when we received the direction from council to proceed with consideration of the removal of the statue. The appeal that has been filed makes three points. Uh, the appellant asserts that number one, the city did not follow the municipal code in approving the certificate of appropriateness. Number two, that the issuance of the certificate of appropriateness violates CEQA. And number three, that federal and state laws and more specifically, uh, the California Arts Protection Act prohibits removal of the statue. And so let me address those three assertions. First of all, relative to the process for the certificate of appropriateness, uh, the appellant is stating that the city did not make the required findings. There are four findings that the Historic Site Preservation Board must make in order to issue a certificate of appropriateness. The first one is that the proposed alteration does not materially impair the character defining features. Again, this is why the report from the city's consultant is important in this discussion in that it identifies the character defining features um, and also evaluates what removal of the statue would do to the site. The uh, evaluation that's provided both in the staff report and in the report from the consultant is that removal of the statue would restore the site back to its original condition during its period of significance. And so consequently, the finding that was made by the Historic Site Preservation Board is that removal of the statue does not materially impair uh, the character defining features. Secondly, another finding that must be made is that the proposed alteration will assist in the restoration of the historic resource. As previously stated, removal of the statue would restore the city hall back to its period of significance uh, and so therefore that finding was made. The next two findings are not materially significant to the discussion. The third criterion that we use to evaluate is that any proposed additions are consistent. Uh, the application relative to the removal of the statute does not propose any additions. And so therefore there is no finding that needs to be made there. And then the final criterion is that any federally funded projects must be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior standards uh, for historic preservation. Uh, the removal of the statue is not a federally funded project. And so on that basis, the uh, Historic Site Preservation Board made the finding that the proposed alteration would not materially impair the site and was consistent with the criteria necessary for issuance of the Certificate of Appropriateness. Um, going on to the next question relative to approval of the certificate of appropriateness is a violation under CEQA. Uh, the finding that has to be made relative to CEQA is that the statue would not cause a substantial adverse change to the historic resource. Again, going back to our report and the character defining features, uh, the analysis that has been made is that removal of the statue will not result in a substantial adverse change. And so consequently, um, the actual process of removing the statue would help to restore the site and therefore does not cause an adverse change. And so uh, that is our response to uh, that um, assertion. Moving on to the final point relative to the removal of the statue being a violation of the California Art Preservation Act. 
In the language of the act, it says that we cannot deface, mutilate, alter, or destroy the artwork. That is not what is being proposed here. The artwork is proposed to be moved either to a new location or to be stored. And under that proposal, it is not a violation of the act. This is further supported by recent case law, the case of Schmidt versus the city and county of San Francisco, where a public artwork was removed from a public site and stored. Uh, it was found that that was consistent with the act and therefore not a violation. Similarly, removal of the Bogart statue for storage or relocation to another site is not a violation of that act. So for conclusion relative to the appeal, number one, the appropriate findings were made for issuance of the certificate of appropriateness. One of the other things I wanted to add in terms of that discussion, going back to the 2012 modification to the historic designation of the site, since this was referenced earlier in public testimony, it specifically states in the approving resolution from 2012, that's resolution number 23016, that no permit for alteration of the interior or exterior of any building or the steps or entry plaza fronting them or the hardscape of the parking lot areas, including any and all properties, elements and characteristics within the designated area shall be issued without prior approval of the Historic Site Preservation Board pursuant to the requirements of chapter 8.05. Basically what is that is saying is that any alteration to the site, including the removal of the statue, must be done under a certificate of appropriateness approved by the Historic Site Preservation Board. I wanted to clarify that fact that the certificate of appropriateness is the proper method to do that. It is not to go back to the city council and modify the historic designation of the site. Uh, and so again, the certificate of appropriateness and the necessary findings were made by the historic site preservation board and the appropriate process was followed. We also find that the action does not violate CEQA it does not violate the California Arts Protection Act. And based on those factors, staff recommends that the city council uphold the historic site preservation board and deny the appeal. Uh, Madam Mayor, that concludes my presentation and we are more than happy to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions uh, for, from council for staff? And I want to emphasize again, this is a time for questions, not for uh, comments. Uh, Council member, of course. Um, I think there are, there are more comments. So um, since it's not a public hearing, but I, I can wait if there are questions from others first. Yeah. Council member Hallstitch. Thank you, Flynn. Appreciate um, your staff report. I have a I have a question there. We heard a number of things in public comments that I think are not true. Um, and I just wanted to um, ask staff's sort of response. So we heard some legal claims. I don't know if uh, Jeff Ballinger would be the, the correct person to um, answer these questions, that question, but we heard some claim legal claims. We heard um, a characterization of the past city council action, um, you know, designating the site, um, you know, that those types of claims. Um, so could you just uh, give a general response to some of the, the claims that you heard in public comment? And, you know, I want to know if they're accurate too. So let me start first with questions about the 2012 action by the city council. Uh, as I had mentioned in my presentation, the 2012 action by city council was to modify the historic designation of city hall to include not only the city hall building, but the city hall site as well. There was a proviso in there relative to the landscape materials not being part of that designation. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that the statue itself was not an individual designation. It is an element on the site and is considered as such. And I hope I pointed that out earlier in the presentation. 
So just wanted to clarify that the statue is not individually designated, but it is part of the site. And so, yes, the assertions that were made there are correct. In terms of how you deal with that, that is one of the reasons why I mentioned the ARG report and the analysis by staff relative to what are contributing elements versus non-contributing elements and the period of significance. Uh, and so that hopefully helps to clarify some of the points that were made there. Um, I, there were a number of other comments that were made and uh, council member Holstage, if you might just point out what those were, I'd be happy to respond to those. Uh, I'll apologize for not remembering all of them right now. Thank you, that was a thorough response. I appreciate it. Um, and that's what I was referring to. And city attorney, if I could just ask the same uh, general uh, question to you, if, if you might uh, reply. Sure, I think, I think uh, staff did a, a very good job of uh, responding to that um, factual uh, inaccuracy um, that was that was made earlier. Um, there were other factual statements made that you know I think staff um, would respond to. That I think there were a number of um, assertions made in the appeal relative to the artistic value of the statue. Um, you know, as as the staff indicates, this is not about the artistic value of the. Of the statue, it's about its historical significance relative to the city hall and its period of, of significance. Um, with regard to the, you know, threats of of lawsuit, um, obviously staff has worked closely with the city attorney's office, uh, both at the HSPB level as well as the appeal level. Um, I believe staff's uh, recommendation is supported by the law, and the findings could be made by both the HSPB as well as the city council. Uh, I know Mr. Pacheco is going to be heard from here shortly um, and probably has different uh, legal opinion, but uh, that that is my uh, opinion. That's what I would render to the city. Thank you. Are there other questions for our staff? Uh, I have a couple. Uh, and uh, Flynn, I'd like to start with you. Uh, uh, Don Mills uh, read uh, former council member uh, Chris Mills uh, letter to us uh, in which uh, he certainly asserted uh, that uh, the 2012 action did incorporate the uh, statue into uh, the uh, uh, design historic designation for the uh, entire site. Uh, could you, I think you've somewhat responded, but could you directly respond to uh, the point that uh, that he raised and I thought raised well? So it goes back to what are the contributing elements versus what are not. I, I don't think it's a question that in the 2012 action, the entire city hall site, the objects on the site were included as part of the designation. But going back to our historic preservation ordinance, which was updated in 2018, uh, and our practice currently relative to historic designation, uh, it's important that you identify when you have a site, what are the contributing elements versus those that are not. And that's especially important when you have a site uh, that has been added to over the years. Uh, consequently, it's important to identify a period of significance. Just to give a point of comparison, we had an item earlier on today's agenda uh, where there was a designation of a residence. Uh, in the resolution approving the designation, it clearly points out what are the contributing features versus those that are not. And so that guides decisions in terms of how we consider alterations to that property in the future. In a similar fashion, it's important to take into account uh, the city hall site, its contributing elements as we look at any alterations to that site. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ballinger, a uh, couple of questions for you. Uh, back on September 29th, we had a special uh, city council meeting to discuss the threshold question as to whether or not the statue should remain in front of uh, City Hall. 
and city council uh, made a decision that evening. Uh, the matter then went to the Historic Site Preservation Board uh, for them to follow up uh, with uh, decisions that they needed to make in order to be able to move forward with the decision that was made on September 29. Uh, am I correct that the only issue, uh, and while we all know that there are larger uh, questions that are here, the only issue that is before city council this evening is the issue as to whether or not to accept or deny uh, the appeal uh, from the, of the decision of the Historic Site Preservation Board. Madam Mayor, that's absolutely correct. Um, the, the, the issues before the city council tonight are, are fairly limited. They're, they're those few findings that uh, Mr. Fagg indicated in his presentation relative to the character defining elements of this, um, of this historic site and how those then interact with the CEQA findings. Um, again, it, it's the, the, the issues before you uh, really uh, aren't about Section 14 or the artistic value or the, the you know, the, the qualifications of the artists who provided the, the statue. It's really the historical significance of, of this feature and whether the city hall's historic designation would be impacted by the removal. Okay, thank you. And all of us on council recognize that uh, uh, for in the hearts and minds of uh, our residents, the issues do go broader, uh, but we as a council have to stick to uh, what is actually in front of us uh, to be decided. Uh, are there other any other questions or comments before I give this to the applicant, uh, council member course? This isn't a public hearing, right? No, it is not. Uh, so is the applicant speaking? I just wanna understand the process. Uh, Mr. Ballinger, could you uh, step in on regarding the process? Yes, yeah, so our uh, municipal code does not designate this as a public hearing. Um, however, as the appellant, uh, I've advised the city that uh, Mr. Pacheco uh, should be entitled to five minutes to give his presentation as part of his. Okay, so then com the comments probably should wait till after that, if that's your preference, Mayor. So I will wait till after that. Thank you. I, I think it would be more appropriate. Uh, Mr. Pacheco, welcome, and uh, you have five minutes, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, the Mayor and City Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. I, I lament to some degree that I only have five minutes. I heard a lot of discussions about other issues tonight, I'm sure all very important to your constituents, but that were much more significant in time allocation than what has been allocated to me. Uh, as you know, I represent Mrs. Frank Bogart and the friends of Mayor Frank Bogart, Palm, Palm Springs City residents. We have filed an appeal of the Historic Site Preservation Board's unlawful decision that they made on February 1st, granting a certificate of appropriateness for the removal of the Frank Bogart statue. We filed an 18 page letter detailing the law and the facts in uh, our appeal. Well, that's very detailed, very legal, and quite a bit of facts. But you know, to distill this in the time that I have allotted, this is a very simple issue. Unfortunately, it's been contorted by staff in its preparation of a report to the HSPB and also to the city council. Now, you have to ask yourself, why would someone do that? Well, the fact of the matter is someone did that because the basis for the removal of the statue had to be concealed. The real motivation for the removal of the statue was not a legal justification. Political correctness and cancel culture are not a basis found in the Palm Springs Municipal Code for the removal or alteration of a historic resource. So they had to find something and create something, and unfortunately, they didn't do it very well. And quite frankly, it's not based on the law, and it's certainly not based on facts. The staff report, unfortunately, conceals the real motivation, and quite frankly, wasn't even mentioned in the HSPB report. This issue arose from the complaints of people from the from the uh, uh, citizens of Palm Springs based on the legacy of Mr. Bogart. Nobody complained about whether or not the statue fit in with the architecture. 
No one's ever complained about that. That came from the staff itself, much like they created this phrase, the period of significance. That's not found in the Palm Springs Municipal Code. That's a concocted phrase used by staff as part of the facade they created. America is a nation of laws. The law, as it relates in Palm Springs Municipal Code, is that only the city council can designate a historic resource. Staff can't do it. An individual council member can't do it. No offense, uh, mayor, uh, but the mayor can't do it. No one can do it. Only the city council majority can designate something as a historic resource. In this particular instance, the facts show very clearly that the statue was there when the two resolutions were in fact passed by the majority of the city council. 1990, the statute was erected, built, constructed, and placed at City Hall. In 1996, the first resolution dealing with City Hall and its site and its features was passed by the city council. There was no exception in that resolution to whether or not the statue was included, but certainly the council knew that it was there. In 2012, again, the city council amended that resolution and passed another resolution. Interestingly, council member Chris Mills at the time voted against this resolution. And I'll mention that and I'll get to that point in a second. But let me read you the resolution because this piece has been absent from uh, the reports you've received, the long presentation you just heard from, uh, staff did not bother to read it to you because it creates a problem. And this is quoting from the resolution that was passed. The City Council of the City of Palm Springs resolved, Section 1, the Class 1 historic designation for the Palm Springs City Hall is hereby amended to include the structures, features, and land of that portion of APN number 502-150-005, bounded by the north edge of the north parking lot and the curb edges along Civic Drive, Tockwitz Canyon Way, and El Cielo Road, accepting the landscape plant materials therein. This resolution that was passed nearly unanimously included the features and structures of this designated area. The designated area surrounded by three streets the statue sits directly in the middle of that designated area and is both by definition a structure and a feature. The resolution went on to mention that all existing or previously approved or installed alterations or improvements shall be cons considered acceptable and consistent with the requirements of Chapter 8.05 of the Palm Springs Municipal Code. 805 defines what a historic resource is. So that sentence essentially says that any existing improvements at the time of this resolution are in fact historic resources. Madam Mayor, just to let you know that five minutes has elapsed. May I continue? Mr. Pacheco, uh, can you finish uh, up please? There's no question that from the resolution itself, the language is clear, but we also know from council member Chris Mills that they discuss the addition of the statue as a historic resource and the council passed it, even though he voted against that resolution. What's the meaning of this? And the meaning of this is because the statue is part of the historic resource and in fact is a historic resource, is that the council has to meet the criteria. An alteration or removal of that statue does not advance that historic resource. The criteria which the council must meet and the, and the HSPB must meet are not satisfied as identified. In addition to that, there is no exemption for a historic resource under CEQA. There needs to be an environmental impact report. None has been prepared. In fact, the city claims that there is an exemption even though the law states otherwise. The bottom line, if I may conclude, Mayor. Thank the you. bottom line is having served in public office myself in the past, the public of America, and I assume in Palm Springs, has a great desire for truth in, that, in, in what government does. And if you wanna get rid of the statue because you think he's not politically correct or there's a cancel culture attack on Mayor Bogart, then do that. But just contort, comport the law, make sure it's followed. In this instance, the law was not followed in a variety of ways. 
It's unfortunate I didn't have more time, but Mayor, I do appreciate you giving me extra time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there questions from count uh, from city council for Mr. Pacheco? Sure. Uh, council member Kors. Mr. Pacheco, did you watch the the two um, discussions of this when the resolution was first discussed on September 15th of 2012? or the March 7th, when the resolution was actually voted on and passed? I'm familiar, I'm familiar with the discussions of council have, members and the reason for those did for you, those I just, yeah, I me, asked, I, I asked you a question. A, I did you watch the video? I, I didn't just yes or no? Chance. Sir, I didn't have a chance to answer your question. I'm familiar with the comments that were made. And yes, I did watch the comments made during those resolutions. And I did see them. And, and, and so I'm familiar that the basis for the removal of the statute has nothing to do with the 1957 and 1965 uh, additions to City Hall. It has, even though staff claims at this point that that's the real basis for the removal. That's not correct. I have no more questions because you're gonna use it to continue to talk about other things. I asked a yes or no question. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kors. Are there any other questions for Mr. Pacheco? Mr. Pacheco, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Okay. All right. Uh, we will now move to uh, city council member comments. Uh, Mr. Kors, council member Kors, excuse me. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so I did today watch both meetings fully and I have um, have email correspondence uh, with council member Mills who I have great respect with. Um, and the statute was not discussed despite several people saying it was um, during this. It was a discussion about parking and uh, Council Member Mills noted that the parking had been uh, changed, so he did not support including that. And landscaping, which they decided should not have to go back to HSPB. So many people said it was um, discussed and specifically called out, but it wasn't. It's not in the resolution, and it was not in, in either of those meetings um, on the video. So I do want to correct that. In addition, Council Member Fote, uh, with my support, actually asked the Public Arts Commission to review relocating the statute in either 2016 or 17, because it was inappropriate given um, the style for the historic uh, city hall building. So that had been brought up before the Arts Commission um, sent it back to council. Uh, so it had been discussed before. So I just wanna correct uh, the record on those two things. Um, also, uh, I think, um, The answer on the process that uh, council, uh, former council member Mills raised, uh, what the right process is, um, was answered uh, already, uh, which is that under our current law, which was amended in 2018 after council member Mills left, so he may not be um, up to speed on that. I don't know whether he is or not. Um, the site was expanded to uh, the border. Uh, but this was not listed as a contributing factor and it wasn't excluded. And because it wasn't excluded, if this was landscaping, it wouldn't go back to HSTB as I understand it. And um, Director Fag can uh, weigh in. But because this was on the expanded site that was adopted in 2012, um, it did have to go back to HSTB. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, Council Member Kors, that is accurate. Okay. If it were not included as part of the site, then there would be no certificate of appropriateness required. However, it is part of the site. And so consequently, the certificate of appropriateness was required. Right. And so that was um, the right process, not amending the site designation, since it wasn't listed specifically as a community. That's program. correct. And that's both in chapter 8.05 of the municipal code as well as in the 2012 ordinance as a condition of approval. Okay. And they are consistent. Thank you. Uh, so in reading the report, it seems uh, clear to me that the proper process was followed um, and uh, that the justifications and findings uh, made by HSTB are appropriate. Uh, I have no other comments. Thank you, Matt. All right. Are there any other comments? from any member of council.
Mr. Pacheco, uh, we've, we've enjoyed having you. Uh, the, uh, there aren't rebuttals then, and so it is an appropriate time for you to uh, turn off your screen, uh, and, but uh, you certainly will continue to be uh, able to watch all of us. I'm sorry, sir, uh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, uh, Mayor. I didn't know I was on mute. Um, I was told by the city attorney that I had two minutes in rebuttal, and that's in an email he sent me actually today. Uh, Mr. Ballinger, uh, can you comment, please? The email uh, reads, staff report, initial questions and clarifications by the city council. Appellant, who is Mr. Pacheco, gets five minutes and then council deliberations, possible action. It does not include any rebuttal because there was no public hearing. If I might ha have a moment, uh, Mayor. Yes, you may. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I saw it in an email uh, from Mr. Ballinger, uh, but you know, I think it's been it, it's been covered, Mayor, and I appreciate your forbearance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So you want me out? <laughs> I, think, I think it's time to, to turn off the video, Sarah, and uh, but I'm sure we will see each other again. You, you have, I assume you have less desire than others to have me out. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, are there other uh, comments that uh, members of council would like to make? Uh, council member course. Sure, just uh, given some public comment, I just want to note that uh, the reason uh, it had to go to HSPB is the law, right? So even though we made our recommendation, there's a process that we had to legally go through. Uh, and I, I just want the public to understand that. Um, and, you know, I do think uh, as we move forward and, you know, set some dates and timing um, uh, in, in how we move forward after this is, is going to be important. So I just want to share that. Uh, let me add a comment uh, that, uh, uh, and it begins with the question that I asked Mr. Ballinger just a little bit earlier. Uh, we're here this evening on a very limited matter, and that is the question of whether or not to uh, grant the appeal or deny the appeal from the HSPB. Uh, the broader issues regarding uh, uh, the statute are issues that we addressed on September 29. Uh, there are, uh, we know that those issues are never gonna go away and that there are going to be strong feelings on both sides of, the, of uh, those issues uh, for, as far as any of us can take and see. Uh, once we move past this evening, uh, the next question that will arise is uh, determining, uh, if at all possible, a location uh, for the statute. Uh, any of us who sat and listened to the public comments this evening know what a challenge that is going to be. Uh, but uh, uh, it uh, is my hope uh, that we can, as a community, meet that challenge and find a place that works reasonably well for the large, uh, for most people in our community. Uh, there, uh, none of us are under any illusion that we will ever get to a location that works for everyone. Uh, are there any other comments from anyone? 
then I think it's time for a motion and a, and then a vote. Uh, council member course. Um, sure. So I would move to deny the appeal um, and to authorize the city manager to work with stakeholders, um, all stakeholders who are interested on a location uh, to move the statute. Um, and if in 60 days there's no acceptable location to um, carefully remove it into storage um, until such time as there is uh, a location for it and to do no damage uh, to the statute. Um, in addition to extend uh, the statute of limitations for the appellant um, to file a lawsuit um, as has been threatened in public comment, um, an additional 30 days to that 60 days um, in order to try and find a location. Is there a second for that motion? I'll second the motion. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I'd like to comment if I can. Sure. Um, I support staff's recommendation. Staff has been extremely thorough on this item. Um, city staff uh, brought this to HSPB, I believe, three times. Is that right? Um, it's been con and, and to, to do a thorough review of this item. Um, I'm just sort of reeling from Mr. Pacheco's argument. Um, he, he walked in and blamed city staff um, to, to calling them cancel culture. You think as an attorney and a former elected official, you'd understand that city council makes policy decisions. Uh, we do that for the people and city staff works for us. And so I think that you're misplaced there in those comments being directed towards city council. Um, I, I've heard, I've been involved in this issue for over a year. Um, and I've and longer, obviously I've served on city council for nearly five years. Um, and I've repeatedly heard primarily black or people of color, um, people from our community call in and share pain about what happened on section 14 and have said that a statue at city hall makes them feel unwelcome to do the people's business and unwelcome to participate in city government, which belongs to them. You know, the entitlement to then come in and ignore that um, and then, you know, make these accusations. I'm sorry, I'm offended by Mr. Ch Pacheco's argument. Seems like, um, you know, they, they want to litigate this matter. Um, but it's um, always been clear to the public. I've actually said many times before this, you know, even before this, that, you um, the statue doesn't match the architecture of the historic building um, that is well known in the community. It was added much, much later. Um, it is not a historic resite, resource. City Hall is. Um, it's why we're famous uh, for mid-century modern architecture. Um, and it's just so clear to me. I know that this is a narrow issue about the certificate of appropriateness. And that issue is, is one that is so clear. Um, that 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 we can clearly issue. Um, this is about a statue on City Hall, and you know, City Council can obviously decide what to do with city property, and we've we followed the law. So, um, I just am a little hurt by the comments continually to ignore the pain that our fellow neighbors and residents have expressed, um, and to make this about one person. Well, you know, I don't support statues of any public servant or public servants. We do it for $29,000 a year, not for a statues erected in our honor. What an honor to have a statue in City Hall for 30 years. I said that last time. Um, no one is entitled to a statue in front of City Hall. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm so sorry that I know I'm going broader than this discuss, than this issue um, at hand, um, but I just wanted to respond to the public comment that um, that we heard tonight and 
Mr. Pacheco's allegations that this is about council culture and political correctness. No, sir. This is about the residents that I heard who said that they feel unwelcome on city property because of a statue, because of what that council and the city did at the time, not about one man, or we've heard those complaints too. So um, I just wanted, I felt the urge and the need to say that in defense of what we do is represent the people um, and make sure everyone is, feels welcome at city. City Hall and to do the city's business and to gauge in democracy with which with us. Um, and so thank you, Madam Mayor, for the um, ability to, to, to respond. Um, but I fully support a staff's recommendation and the resolution um, and the motion by council member course, not Mr. Course. I think he was called by Mr. Pacheco. Um, and staff, should we restate those findings uh, for the record, or do you think they're adequately cited uh, by council member Kors's motion? Um, I, I think they're adequately stated. If, if uh, I could just clarify for the record that his motion is based on the findings that are contained in both the staff report and the resolution. Thank you. Can I read them just um, to be thorough in case litigation comes from this? Um, that the proposed alter the findings in support of the decision uh, that the proposed alteration does not significantly impact or materially impair the character defining features of the historic resource as listed in the resolution for historic designation or where a character defining feature may be impacted. The proposed alteration minimizes that impact as much as possible that the proposed alteration will assist in restoring the historic resource to its original appearance where applicable or substantially aid in its preservation or enhancement as a historic resource, um, that any additions to the historic resource are consistent with the massing proportions, materials, and finishes of the existing historic resource um, and continued through uh, finding number three um, in the Palm Springs Municipal Code and the Certificate of Appropriateness. Um, and I think that's the only one I need to read out loud. Is that correct, city staff? Yes. Thank you. Are there any other comments from council? Uh, roll call, please. Council member Kors. Yes. Council member Holstich. Yes. Council member Woods. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right, we will now move on to uh, item 5D, which is a revised city council rules of procedure. I'd like to ask for a staff report. Uh, Madam Mayor and city council, for your consideration or revisions to the city council's rules of procedure, Based on the City Council's direction, the revisions seek to formalize the process for council members to request that a matter be agendized for a future meeting, ensure that important topics are considered earlier in the meeting, utilize gender neutral terms. Uh, the staff report outlines each of the significant proposed changes and if desired, I can pull up the report to review in more detail and I'm available for questions. Are there questions from Mr. Mejia? Well, I have one, Anthony. Uh, after reading all of this work, uh, we're going to miss you an awful lot. So uh, do you take uh, evening phone calls? And... Often. <laughs> all right. Um, it's been a long night, but uh, are there, and this is an extremely well-written report, but uh, let me ask again, are there any questions for uh, staff? I see none. Uh, uh, okay. Council member Holstich. I think council member Kors was first. I'll oh, go after him. I, I, just, first. I just had a question. Um, it talks about placement of items on meeting agendas. Um, and so one, it says the city manager is responsible for scheduling agenda items for city council meetings. I thought that the 
city rules allowed for the mayor and the city manager to work in partnership or for council and the mayor to and um, the city manager to work in partnership to set the agenda. So is this a departure from what we typically do and what might be stated in our charter or other ordinances or this is our current practice? City manager or city attorney or city clerk? So I, I would certainly defer to Mr. Ballinger on any legal issues in compliance or conformance with the charter, but I think the combination of the first two ways cited in the rules of procedure for things to be added to the agenda certainly do contemplate the collaboration you're talking about, although it does not seem to empower directly collaboration between any one member of the council and the city manager. Just bear in mind, too, that while almost every meeting, and here in a minute we'll do it, um, look at future meeting agendas and, and collaborate that way. There are many, many more routine items that come by way through the departments in the city manager's office for the kinds of things that um, you know, aren't public policy oriented, right? That might be contracts that need approval or just other things that are generally not discussed or collaborated on. So that's kind of the bulk of items that would be introduced by the city manager. Alternatively, or additionally, I should say, there's this collaboration that does occur between the full council body and, and um, really among itself to agendize any other items. So that's really, I think, where the collaboration comes in. But Mr. Ballinger? Yeah, the charter uh, in our municipal code, does uh, they do not provide the mayor any uh, additional uh, authority to add agenda items. The Brown Act sort of does in the sense that it allows a mayor to call a special meeting and that kind of inherently allows a mayor to um, add those items to the special meeting. But as far as regular meetings, um, the, the mayor is in the same position as other council members. Thank you. That's helpful. I just don't want the, I think that um, council plays an important role in agenda setting and I, maybe that's in number two, um, you know, but I just don't want to give full authority for agenda setting to the city manager in the future. You know, imagine if someone were stonewalling and not allowing it, but I think that not you, you're, you know, a successor in 30 years or whatever it is. So, um, but maybe number two adequately addresses that. Is that right? That's right. It's the combination of those two things that really Kind of complete the full circle that and and frankly if there was any tension say between a city manager and a council number two also doesn't require the collaboration of the city manager so right. the council can agendize anything it wants uh, the city manager can presumably do the same thing but really it is the interaction of those two and as we look through things like future agendas where there is it is kind of collaboration but again neither can really veto the other um, if that makes sense yeah, that's helpful. I think that then that makes a lot of sense that there's a city manager element as the CEO of the city or the um, manager and then the city council ability to do that. And then I just had a question about number three. Um, if you could just explain how that would work in practice to the public and the council and in a way that it would be consistent with the Brown Act, because I think right now all of us avoid talking to each other about any issue at all um, to avoid a Brown Act a violation. And um, I'm just a little confused about what outside of a meeting, if only there's a need to take immediate action that precludes the use of the other two options, a council member may sponsor and seek two co-sponsors to add to an agenda to the item. So that's new to us. We're not used to finding two co-sponsors for anything ahead of a meeting. I'm a little worried it might invite Brown Act violations. Sure. So let me first describe it so that everyone knows what we're talking about. We can ask Mr. Ballinger to elaborate on Brown Act issues, and then we might even discuss processes that will insulate that um, from Brown Act vulnerability. So as we described, um, one way things get on the agenda is just through the city manager. The other is through action of the council at a council meeting. The significant disadvantage in that process is the council meets twice per month. That's generally adequate for typical policy discussions that you can say sometime in the next month or even at the next meeting, we'd like to consider an item. On occasion, though, there might be things that are very timely where a council member is not afforded the opportunity to confer with the rest of the council at a regular meeting. When that happens, the only way that council member could get something agendized is to ask the city manager. Uh, usually that works, especially for any regular run-of-the-mill agenda item. 
But just as you described, maybe not me, but with the successor or maybe a different council, if there were ever tension there, it could presumably put a city manager in the middle, especially if it were an issue where a council was already known to be divided. So a council member comes and says, I don't have time uh, to, to bring this up at the next meeting because maybe there's a grant deadline or there's something else that really precludes it from being discussed by the full body at the next regular meeting. So the only thing they can do is approach the manager. This third way to get something agendized is meant to alleviate putting the manager in the middle, right? So it enables a council member to, to put something on the agenda with two supporting sponsors, which is the same majority vote that would be required during a regular business meeting, except it occurs outside that meeting. That should not involve any discussion of how the matter should be um, voted. In fact, many bodies elect to put things on an agenda so that they're heard and that there's kind of a procedural um, matter, but, but really that doesn't even convey they support voting in favor or against the matter, right? So I think um, Mr. Boundary can weigh on, on the Brown Act, but if that conversation is limited to simply saying, yes, this item should be scheduled or no, it shouldn't, that it's not a Brown Act violation, and if we want to preserve that and make sure that there isn't further discussion on the merits of the item, um, we could create some processes to do that. That would probably mean a council member submits a form and, and seeks a sponsorship without discussion, but just through a static description of the item meant to be discussed or something like that. Mr. Boundary. I would agree. I think this is very much the exception to the rule um, uh, for most situations. Um, and just like I mentioned, the mayor is allowed to call a special meeting um, and add an agenda item to that special meeting. The Brown Act also allows three members of a council to call a special meeting, and that necessarily uh, involves uh, some limited discussion about whether or not to add that agenda item or call that meeting. And, and so I think the Brown Act supports this limited discussion of whether or not to add an agenda item without getting into the merits of it. Thank you. Are there other questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Kors. Hey, uh, thank you. Um, that covered uh, most of what I was gonna ask. Um, and I, I just had a little of the same, similar concern on just the language about the same manager sort of controls the agenda. There's a lot that obviously, there are time constraints and things along those lines. And maybe there's just a way, maybe it's three members of the council can put something on, but also can prioritize timing. Right. I think that's that was the issue to me. Right. Um, we don't want. If the majority of council wants something on at the next meeting. Uh, we should be we able should to make that, that call, call. Not just that we want it on a future agenda. So maybe that. And I know we we are going to do regular updates and we look at the thing, you know, we have time to give input, but just maybe to clarify that and less everyone thinks that's clear enough. That That was my concern. I think neither provision really speak to the timing, but the fact that both provisions allow either the city manager or council to put something on the agenda, if that action contemplated timing. So if council said, I'd like to place on the next agenda, this item, That's it fine. would be on the next agenda. Okay, yeah. great. That was my only question. Thank you. Any other questions? Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Just have um, a comment. I wanted to just point out um, this is section six at the bottom of page two uh, about presentations, proclamations, and recognitions. I wanted to highlight this mostly for the public um, because we are looking at limiting um, the number of presentations that we do at our city council meetings um, and prioritizing doing proclamations and such at the events that we're hosting. Um, and this is a big change because I think as the, the our Residents know we tend to do a, a pretty long intro to our meetings, and part of this change is to have more time to really discuss um, the people's business. And so as important as recognitions are, we want to be able to really get into the meat of the issues and not have um, conversations super late into the evening. So I, I really support that. And I think that um, there are other ways for us to highlight things. Um, for instance, um, if a proclamation is given at a particular event, you know, we could put the recording of that reading on channel 17. We've talked before about ways to better utilize channel 17. So I don't want anyone to feel like 
um, if their proclamation or if their presentation wasn't done at City Hall, that it is not as important. It's um, about um, making sure that we have time to, to get to the business and that there are lots of ways that we can make sure that our residents are recognized and that we rotate um, what comes in each year. So thank you. All right. Uh, question uh, for staff. This is a resolution. If uh, we were to find that there's a section uh, or in here that is not working, uh, define what the process would be for council uh, to revise that, uh, that, that section. Certainly. So uh, the city council could direct staff to uh, bring forward any amendments to the uh, rules of procedure. Uh, the council could take action um, at that meeting and those rules would be effective immediately. So we're talking about something that at uh, that could happen as quickly as uh, two meetings. One to identify that we need to look revisit a procedure and then a second meeting to actually enact that revision. Absolutely. All right. So, you know, I think that's a really important uh, uh, matter as we're looking at something like this. Uh, we've got, an, it's always hard to get this perfect. If we find we've made a mistake, this is not the constitution that we're trying to change. All right. Other comments? Uh, then is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> There's no further discussion. Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Yes. Council Member Kors. Yes. Council Member Holstich. Yes. Council Member Woods. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Motion passes five to zero. All right. Uh, and at 10.02 p.m., we have gotten to the 10 o'clock hour when we uh, take public comment on non-agenda items. Uh, Mr. We have no public comment for this evening, Madam Mayor. We have none. Okay. Then we are to city council member and uh, city manager requests an upcoming agenda development. Mayor, if it's your pleasure and the pleasure of the council, I'm happy to share my screen and put up the um, future meetings document that we've been reviewing. So speaking of collaborating on the agenda, here we go. Is everybody seeing the right screen? Let me try this. Okay, <laughs> I never know which side to put it on. Okay, so um, what you'll see is really March 10th has a number of um, heavier items. And so more than likely, some of these will already need to move until March 24th. We do have uh, an appeal, some um, general plan related business. We also need to finish up our CDBG um, that we started this evening. And then it is also timely that we make progress on the franchise agreement in 1383 compliance. So we're going to need to change this a little bit. And right now, March 24th, looks like there is um, plenty of space. We have a study session available. One of the other things that staff is really waiting for is to uh, schedule a follow-up meeting with College of the Desert to um, fulfill the, the discussion that was planned, but we weren't able to complete uh, previously. So um, pending that, we also have in mind to do a review of short-term rental uh, programming that could take place on a March study session. But again, we're, that's kind of pending, uh, scheduling something with the College of the Desert, which right now um, is, I believe, the priority of council. So lots will still change by the end of March, as it often does, as we also uh, confer with staff on new items or items that aren't quite ready for the 10th. Uh, but these are the items to look forward to in the next couple of meetings, and we are open to any feedback. I can't see everyone, so... Uh, I have something. Yes, Council Member Garner. Or Thank Mayor Pro Tem Garner, excuse me. No worries. Thank you. Um, 
just to, to, to kind of kick us off, the general plan, vision, and priorities discussion, um, I would support moving that to March 24th. I would I, I really would like to, for us to have a robust discussion on that. Um, and I think it would make sense to, to move it. Um, and I also support that March study session being about vacation rentals. I, I understand the, the potential conflict there, but I think to, to the extent that it's possible, I would like that. So I don't know if there are any uh, others in support of those two uh, options. Uh, respectfully, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner on vacation rentals, I I think we need some more study work before we would be able to move that that quickly to it. I, I appreciate the urgency, I, but uh, I know there's a lot of data I want to get that we've just not been collecting. Uh, Council Member Kors. Sure. Um, I would support that um, because I think we need to decide what we want to look at. So staff's not getting data on everything, um, but what are the issues that we want to deal with, especially around the impacts on housing? Um, and I think that's how it was sort of in our work plan, right? That it was set for this month when we on our study session two days ago, it was going to be happen in March if possible, so we could give direction to staff so they have time to bring back any changes with the data to, to a council down the road. And I think they thought they need several months to do that. Uh, so I think the idea was to limit what kind of data they needed to, to get based on the input from the community and then from council. Yeah, and the other thing I might just mention there is oftentimes, even when we might consider in a vacuum what kind of data we want to look at, once you start looking at the data, it often raises more questions. And, and so we do, we've been collecting some data and really working to make sure that it's somewhat comprehensive, at least from what we have available. So if this agenda item moves forward, we think we'd have a lot to review. Um, and then in the event that you want more data, especially that we haven't already been collecting, that would especially be the time where we might need a little bit of time to, to go and look for those numbers or even start new measurements that, that we don't have in place currently. Fair enough. Are there questions or comments? Uh, Council Member Woods. Uh, uh, just that, you know, um, is 60 minutes enough for the general plan or does that need to be a study session? I mean, that's, you know, that's a big issue. And I know we're updating just certain elements of the general plan, um, but you know, like bus stops came up tonight and that could be a 20 minute conversation onto itself. And I'm just wondering if 60 minutes is going to be enough. I know it's just priorities, um, but I just wanted to, yeah, that meeting seems very packed with very important issues. That's why, and uh, so yeah. I, I agree with the mayor pro tem. <laughs> so, so let me just share my screen one more time. I, I do think these are good points it, and just take note that we actually have a number of general plan components scheduled for conversations. So we have the housing element, which is a conversation we've had a few times, which may or may not be ready as we are also working with um, state for approval. Um, then we also have the general plan vision and priorities discussion, which I think is also meant to be iterative, similar to the housing element. But really, when you take those two together, um, it, it's possible that that could be a, an appropriate um, topic for a work session and give us a little more time to really explore those. I think either way, uh, especially the plan, the vision and priorities discussion is one that would be iterative. So similar to uh, short-term rentals or lots of big conversations, we'd probably only get so far in an initial conversation and then would have to do either some drafting or some follow-up research or some other things uh, before we were ready for a second conversation. So um, I'm happy to take notes from council on that and also to um, confer with um, Deputy City Manager uh, Fag, who's on the call and can weigh in as well. Just to speak to that, uh, I think a study session would be more than appropriate. That gives us a little bit more flexibility in terms of the discussion with council. Um, as the city manager has indicated, you've already seen the vision and priorities. We have done additional outreach since you last saw it, uh, have made some modifications there and discussed those with the planning commission. Um, 
keep in mind that this is a small portion of some of the other changes you'll be seeing relative to the general plan and the discussion of bus stops and other things will come as we get into detail of the circulation element and also land use element points, which will be further down the line in terms of our discussion. So uh, I, I do believe vision and priorities could be done in about an hour um, and might be appropriate in a study session rather than uh, a regular meeting of city council. Uh, but we're happy to take the direction of city council in terms of how you would like us to bring that forward to you. Um, I'm open. I just don't know how in depth my fellow council members might want to go uh, into it. So um, I'm pretty briefed on it, but I'll, I'll leave it up to them to decide. And, and if I could just briefly, one other thing to consider is that we're going to be moving into the budget process pretty soon. And instead of trying to do that really as a component piece of regular meetings, which works for kind of a carryover budget like we did last year or the current fiscal year, but especially with the volume of requests that we might have associated with new priorities and a real review of the CIP, we contemplate using two study sessions to discuss budget likely in April and May. So just think about the, the, the broader picture with the calendar. If we don't review short-term rentals and elect instead to maybe look at general plan components, it, it might raise the question when we can catch up with short-term rentals, which we also think is, is kind of of the size worthy of a study session. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Garner. Thank you. Um, I, I'm mostly interested in just having that discussion fresh. Um, and so making sure that it's at the top of the meeting. Um, I, I agree um, with Flynn that I don't think it would necessarily take too long. Um, definitely an hour, maybe a little bit more, but um, I'd prefer a study session to be on something else as long as that general plan session could be at the top of an agenda. But I also wanted to um, ask about Council Member Holstage's comments from at the top of the meeting and find out what the timing <laughs> was for that potential budget all allocation and what that would take. Is that a question for me? Yes. Um, yeah, and just to be clear, so I'm asking uh, for this to come forward earlier because um, there are there are a few weeks out. The state is a few weeks out from publishing initial guide guidance um, and regulations about allocating the thirty five million dollars in state funds um, to communities. Um, and so we'll have more information then. Um, but I did get sort of an urgent request from Queer Works and DAP Health, um, to fund the initial, um, part of that pilot program and to do the work to out secure state funding, philanthropy dollars, other funding, um, to build out a true pilot program. Does that answer your question or what was your specific question? Or you want me to give background, detailed background? No, I don't need detailed background. I'm just more interested in the timing on what agenda this would be on if, if there's support for it. Yeah, thank you. So I think, Councilmember Corris, did you want to answer? No, I was just going to say from a uh, discussion that we had um, with uh, DAP is um, if we could do it the second meeting in March because if we support it, you know, they have to invest and do a bunch of stuff. If we don't, it sort of ends it. And so they're not spending a lot of resources unless they know that we're, we're there. Uh, so if we can do that the second, me the second meeting, um, whether, you know, we want to provide uh, some initial funding, it's not a staff work. You know, the organizations do the work. And that's why it needs a, an organization to do this. But I think it's going to be $35 million grants I don't know if the state's changed that, but I thought that was the original plan. Um, and so they, you know, they have to invest in doing the startup work so they can be in the best position to get those that grant that's needed to do the program. Thank you. I'm I'm supportive of that. Yes, am I. Are there any other comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clifton, uh, with the lifting of the uh, uh, COVID restrictions, uh, will we be returning to chambers on March 10? At the pleasure of council, we certainly can. Uh, it's my desire that we return to chambers. 
I think the only thing we might need to check on is um, we are still subject to uh, state law and OSHA, and, and OSHA in particular may require masks, depending on the, the setup of council chambers, we'd have to look at that one issue. Um, but, but otherwise, I think the, the door is open to return to in person. Uh, Councilman Kors. I support that as well. Um, if if it's the setup that's a concern under OSHA, because I think we all don't want to wear masks so the public can see us. Um, you know, one option might be, I know some places have used plexiglass. I don't know if that would solve OSHA's issue. Um, and then on the mayor's coalition, a lot of cities have gone to the convention centers or ballrooms or a place where people could be more spread out. So if we can't do it in chambers, my preference would be then maybe to do it at the convention center rather than not do it in person, if that makes sense. One thing to just bear in mind, I did check with the convention center. The good news is that our tourist economy is strong and they're busy. They likely do not have space for us on any of our regular meetings until at least May. There's some large hotel ballrooms that might donate them to the city as well. So um, it would be good to try and do it in person. And if there's an OSHA way we can do it, that would be great. And I'm happy to look into that. Thank you. Is there any opposition to the city manager following up uh, in that area? And one more thing to clarify, I think our intent when we started talking about going back in person um, initially is that we're really talking about council for now. At some point, it may be appropriate to open the chambers to members of the public. But I also think our direction was to try to maintain the hybrid setting so that we could both accommodate residents who want to continue to have the convenience of weighing in at, at home and so that we can accommodate um, when council members are traveling or other things and need to zoom into a meeting. So I think even when we return to chambers, we will maintain uh, the hybrid options to accommodate both council members and members of the public. Yeah, that additional flexibility is gonna come in handy from time to time. Is there anything else, uh, Council, this evening? All right. Well, again, uh, this was a long evening, uh, a lot of difficult conversation, all of it done uh, respectfully. And uh, I thank all of the people of Palm Springs. Uh, this adjourns our meeting. We adjourn in the honor of uh, Charles Dunn, uh, the next regularly scheduled City Council meeting will be held on March 10, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Stay safe, everyone.